Let's do it. Got that green light. Got that white page. I don't even know if it starts recording when I press start or when YouTube kicks on, but either way, we are good to go. We are good to go. Oh, I didn't write the tweet. Wow, every week. Every week. If you're watching this not live, then you probably wanna jump forward five minutes. You know, we hang for a second and let people come in. If you are the first one in, if you are just coming in right now, then you're probably someone that watches the show. And you probably know that the first minute of every show is me writing the tweet. I have to write the tweet. I didn't do it this time. Normally I have been. I've been pretty good about it. Why is the RN parentheses right now so funny? Everyone does it. It's so funny. Uh, I'm just going to write this tweet really quick and then I'll get the paints in order and I'll uh, hang with you guys for a second before we do this. Session edition. And I need the TV emoji. If you're in the chat, I'll be there literally in one second. I never know with a tweet, you know, if I should if I should say exactly what I'm planning on doing. You know, I can't tell. Or if I should just leave it ambiguous, like, yo, come check it out, it's gonna be dope. Can't really tell. I can't tell which is more enticing, you know. And I need the link, obviously. The whole entire reason Oh, nice. People are in the chat. All right, one second. I'm just going to grab the link. I didn't know what to write, so I just wrote some random shit, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to grab the link. You're going to hear my voice coming out of my computer for one second. The entire reason I post the tweet. And then we're good to go. I'm actually stoked to hang out with you guys, honestly. Uh, oh, I pressed tweet. All right, well, I hope there's no typos because I pressed tweet without checking it, but it's all good. All right, let's do this. Let's do it. I gotta organize my windows. I like the black YouTube window. I got the OBS, that's the streaming software up. People are here, it's Owen time, what's good? Yes, people are here. Nice, how's it going guys? How's it going everybody? In typical me fashion, I am, well I planned it. It's not really unplanned, but I'm just gonna organize my paints really quick on the stream. Look, they're really not organized right now. My painting teacher from, from she's not from college actually, but my painting teacher that I'm thinking of right now would probably slap me in the face, so it's all good. But uh, how's it going, guys? It's going pretty well on my end, honestly. Um, same deal as last week. I'm just getting all the studio stuff together for the holidays. It's taking me way longer than I thought. I'm coming to terms. Are oh, you refreshing the YouTube page? That's epic. Nice. Peter M said best time of the week. Flattering. Flattering that I have been incorporated into people's lives in such a fashion. Anyway, yeah. Uh, basically over here at the studio, I mean, you were probably here last week, probably. Uh, so I'm getting everything ready. I'm kind of just coming to terms with the fact that I am, to use one of my favorite metaphors, trying to stuff... 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag. So I'm probably just gonna have to say that the book is gonna happen like after Christmas. I'm pretty okay with it, you know, uh, it's not a big deal, but I'm kind of just coming to terms with the fact that like in the next few days, magically all that stuff is not gonna happen. Uh, so I think I'm gonna push the book back, but otherwise it's going pretty well. The studio is full of these framed prints that are all bubble wrapped up, otherwise I'd show you. Uh, what else is going on? I got the next batch of shirts and graphics and all that stuff coming in. I got some hoodies. Mostly it's t-shirts and hoodies. You know, of course, you can tell the extent to which I know what I'm doing because I'm getting a bunch of t-shirts delivered in the middle of winter. That's uh, really just really just figuring it out as I go over here. But it's all good. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking for the holidays, that's what I'm gonna have together is the shirts and the prints. 
I got to get, I got the rosary prints all framed up. So I have 40 of these rosary prints here. That's pretty tight. Most of them are boxed up. And then I'm going to print the angelology prints tomorrow. I'm pretty stoked about that. That should be easy to do in a day. It took me like a day and a half to print out and frame 40 of them. It took me like two days, really. But that's like literally all I did. Like I woke up, came here, did it, went back home. Uh, back home. I'm, at, I'm, You know what I mean? I went back to normal life for like an hour and then went to bed and came back and did it the next day. Um, so I should be able to do the angelology prints tomorrow. That's kind of what I'm looking forward to. And then I don't know if I'm going to get the Servite rosary prints together. That's the other thing. I got this case here. I know it's 701, so we'll just like hang for a second. I started like a minute late, but I don't want to make you guys wait. So we'll hang for just a second and then we'll uh, pull the trigger. So I also made these Servite rosary prints. They look sick, but the thing is, I don't know. I made a font. So I made a, uh, if you're following the whole, you're following the whole Owen art saga, um, when I did that Halloween comic, I made a font to go in the comic and I think it was split. I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but I think it was split if people could read it or not because half the people were like, yo, this is incredible. And then some people were like, I literally can't even read this. <laughs> so that font didn't go so well. So I made another font that was more legible and it's what I'm going to use for the Servite rosary prints. But the problem is I used honestly kind of a cheap software to make it. And I don't know if it's pixelated. It looks like a little pixelated on the Photoshop. So I'm hoping when I print it, it's not pixelated. If it is, I'll have to write it by hand or like, you know, finagle some like font making program. But I'm hoping it's not, but uh, I think let's see what's going on here with me. Um, we'll pull the trigger at like 7.05. So we'll give people like two more minutes and then we'll just get going. Cause I want to do this thing. Um, otherwise, what's going on with me, man? Uh, it snowed here for the first time. Training my dog, that's normal. Stuff relevant to the show, though. Uh, honestly, you know, I kind of, if you've, if you've been hanging around for a while, for a little bit more than, you know, a day, probably, uh, you know, I always use the metaphor of, like, going between these, like, different topics that are all related, like, under the surface, you know. Um, and I kind of just, you know, you know what happens to me, honestly, what, what it's like is... It's like I'm stumbling along doing my like research through like different topics. And I sometimes use the metaphor of like, oh, it's like you turn over a stone and you're like, wow, there's all this stuff here. But that's honestly not really what it's like. It's more like I'm in a house and I go to a, a part of the house and I look down this hallway where there's all these rooms and I'm like, how did I not come over here more recently? Like, I haven't been, I haven't been in this part of my house for like like years what the heck I almost, I almost forgot this was over here actually and when i go to that part of the house again it like revitalizes and kind of like reintegrates with all the other things i've been like studying so it's this like perpetual circle but the circles just get like tighter and tighter and tighter it's like the metaphor i use every time which i stole from rilke which i also plug every time because you should read rilke anyway though so that happened to me recently i was kind of going super hard on like history of the papacy i guess i guess that was like the main thing because it related to you know, it's like I'm filling in these holes, you know, it's like I'm filling in these holes in my, like, understanding of, of things, and, uh, somehow or another, it kind of naturally got me thinking about, like, you know, I feel like I was drifting forward through Christian history so far, and then I decided, not decided, but I kind of was, like, you know, looking back, and there's a few things we'll probably talk about, it. I was, I was looking at some Rudolf Steiner stuff, which is also, like, a whole interesting topic, but I kind of was just like, you know, I feel like I should hit like the pre-Christian stuff that leads like into Christianity. Like I was thinking about some Greek philosophy stuff I haven't thought about in a really long time and how it leads like into Christianity and uh, a lot of things that I, I hit a long time ago really hard from like a different angle. I'll, I'll pull the trigger on starting the show right after I kind of explicate this. But it's kind of like before when I was really hardcore, like, um, like, you know, identifying with like the occult and like I was like Western occult boy, you know. It's like I hit all like the Platonism and like Plato and like Neoplatonism stuff and I hit it so hard like from this angle because it does dovetail with that kind of like a culty like esoterica vibe. But there's this like other side of it that butts up against like Christianity. I'm thinking like Alexandria, like second, third century. Um, so it's kind of cool. I'm kind of like stoked about, you know, not that I have time to read anything right now because I'm trying to keep the studio <laughs> going, but I don't know, I'm kind of stoked. It's kind of cool. I'm never bored, honestly. I'm never bored in my mind. Um, I think that's why I kind of like you know, broadcasting stuff online also. Anyway, let's see what people said, and then I'm going to pull the trigger on doing this thing. Recently moved in with my grandma, and every morning I wake up to her praying the rosary. That's epic. That's wholesome. 
I don't have that level of wholesome. I, I kind of do. I mean, I have a wife here and a dog. They're pretty wholesome. Show that ring. My ring actually, oh, you can see my ring actually through the through the glove. Yeah, you can see it. I'm not going to plug it too hard, but I mean, I guess lots of people probably have this ring. Um, but I am married, which I only mention so that all the guys out there that are just as strange as me know that there's, there's hope. Um, draw Plato and Moses shaking hands. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny, actually. We'll talk about stuff like that. It has nothing to do with what we're going to paint. Actually, it kind of does, but, you know, anyway. Anyway, that's enough of that. We are going to pull the trigger. I am scrolling through the options for the buttons to press. I see the button. It's time. The moment is imminent. It's coming. It's here. Thus beginneth the painting show. What's going on, everybody? So I got one or two more things I got to do before we get going, but it's all good. I just got to really tear this page off over here. I feel like the light just got brighter, but let's just roll with it. The lighting is the whole thing. I like want it to be like blown out. Like I want the, speaking of what we were just talking about, like the platonic ideal of like a perfectly white page is what I want to, to greet you when we, when we start the show. Anyway, how's it going? I'm very excited to be here right now, and let's just get it going. Oh yeah, things I gotta say at the start of the show. Intro music, the band's Painted Worlds, Painting Show, Painted Worlds. Check it out. Other things, uh, if you've never been here before, sometimes it's people's first time, that's cool. Uh, usually the way it goes is I have stuff I wanna talk about, get the ball rolling on the painting, and then we kinda naturally segue into me, you know, hanging out, not hanging out in the chat, I mean I am, but we're painting, chatting, seeing what's going on. Uh, so, Point is, if you want me to see it, you have to put at Owen Cyclops, like a few people did, like Isidore or Snake Hands. Uh, put at Owen Cyclops. Otherwise, I'm not gonna see it. But with that being said, let's get it going. So, uh, if you've been here before, you know that I like to start out with kind of a. I like to start out with a little strange book off my shelf intro. I think it's really, really cemented to be a part of the show that I've, I've really come to enjoy. And recently, I picked up this bad boy. So I go on uh, I go on ventures to stores that sell old things, and I often find books there. And normally I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked that I almost never spend more than like two or three dollars on a book. This book was eight dollars, therefore it was blowing my price math averaging situation out of the water. But I thought it was worth it. It's absurdly large. I'm not going to refocus the camera. I knew this would happen, but I thought I would just roll with it. It makes it look bigger actually. It's this huge book. It's really, really, really big. And it's called The Dawn of European Civilization. And I saw this bad boy sitting on the floor of this like old furniture store. And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm down with that. And I thought I would just plug it really quick because you can see I'm always, when it, honestly, I think I probably mentioned it like once a show, maybe. Uh, or I mention it whenever I write anything about my art, sometimes on Patreon or on Twitter even, perfect example. I'm always, I always say I'm going for this like 1000 AD to like 400 AD style, but that's literally exactly what this is. This whole book is about the style of European art from almost like, I guess you could say like 300 AD up to like 1000 AD. And it's got some sick images in here. And I just feel like there's something 
about, let's see if I can find the page I was thinking of. You'd think I could have bookmarked it knowing that I was doing the show the entire day, but I didn't. Um, I think there's something about this like time and vibe in terms of images that has something like so powerful to offer. I feel like it has something like deep in here. I'm looking for the paintings, it's showing all architecture and stuff, but just the drawing style, the way it like hovers between like drawing and painting. I just feel like there's something in that style that I really relate to and wanna like harness in my work. Let's just look through here really quick. It's this kind of thing where the images are like flat, but not totally flat. Like it's almost like writing almost. They're pictures, like you're getting shading in, like it's 3D, but it's 2D. This is a really dope example. Perfect actually, this is perfect. So you can see in here, I know it's probably small if you're watching on your phone or whatever, but you can see what I'm getting at. Like the way it's like, the it's almost like the idea of the image is taking precedent over how your eye would actually see it. Um, it's a little like heady, I guess, but it's almost more like your brain sees things more so than how your eye sees things, if that makes sense. Like I'm gonna bring it up to the camera a little bit. So you can see even up here, I know it's really tiny, but it's just a really good example I happen to open to. These are all people sitting around a table. It's like, that's not really how they would look in real life, but like if your mind had the idea of like people sitting at a table, that's kind of how you would imagine it. They would be like sitting all around. Same deal with this drawing, you can see it's kind of like flat, like you can see like the, the strokes of his uh, robe and stuff. I actually haven't even looked at this before, honestly. I just thought I would pull it out before the show, but it's pretty tight. Let's do one more. I know one of the spreads starts out with, oh, this is what I was looking for this whole time. Epic. So you can see down here, we got these guys down here. This is from some, I actually did look at this before. This is from some like super early like German manuscript or something. Honestly, I'm not even sure. But here you can really see what I'm talking about. Like the artist, it's like, the wings are just almost like the idea of wings. We're like nowhere near the Renaissance where someone's like keeping like dead bird wings in their studio. They really did that by the way, in case you don't know. Um, and like trying to make them look real. You know, these people down here, everyone's like fit into these little compartments, like standing perfectly next to each other. There's just something about the vibe, man, like the early Euro vibe that I feel like we need to like tap into a little bit more. So I saw this, I was really stoked about it, obviously. I mean, some of this is like something I would paint. Honestly, we should just do an episode of the show where I just like go hard on some like older manuscript or something. Anyway. So that would be a good kickoff. Even the even the decoration, you know? It's like minimalist, maximalist. You can't really tell where it's trying to be at. Let's do one more little spread of like color images. This is pretty tight. Like I said, I haven't actually looked at this before. Some of it's pagan, but most of it's Christian. But even the pagan stuff, you know, it like leads into it, like bleeds into the, the Christian stuff in a way. I guess we already looked at this one. But it's just so tight, man. I don't know if you guys are vibing. I'm vibing. I'm really getting the show. Let's check out one more. This is the last one. This is the last one, then we're gonna then we're gonna keep it moving. Thank you, brother. Oh, yes. See, perfect. This is the note we're gonna end on. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's like a scene, you know, and it's 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 logical. Like there's people outside the castle walls, and there's people like inside the castle walls, but it's still totally flat because it's like you're in your mind. You know, it's like this scene is taking place like in your brain, if that makes sense. I don't know, that's how I think of it, honestly. And like even the churches, we're probably gonna utilize a little bit of this perspective. Um when we get into what we're gonna do right now, but you can see even up here, like, uh, I didn't think there would be this perfect of an example, otherwise I would have like blown it up or something. But you can see here, like this church, you're seeing the front of the church, right? But then the side just comes out. So the front is like you're looking front on, and the side is like you're looking straight onto the side. It doesn't really obey like linear perspective in the way that we're gonna be like constrained into in a, in a few hundred years from here, actually. Oh, map. Okay, I gotta stop, I gotta stop, I gotta give it up. But I mean, this is just tight. It's just tight, just the aesthetic. It's so good, okay, we gotta stop. But we can't, we can't stop because we love, we love art, we can't stop. All right, this is the last thing we'll look at. Pretty tight, some metal working. It's like the cover of this gospel book. Anyway, I actually never looked at that before, so it's pretty dope. I should just always have a book primed up that I've never looked at before. Anyway, it doesn't necessarily directly relate to what we're about to do right now, but it kind of does actually, in a way. So uh, I want to jump in to what I have planned right now. I'm just going to grab a pencil or something because I'm going to, actually I'm not going to use a pencil. I have to peel off, perfect, a guitar pick. This must be good for something, right? I'm just going to peel off the top page of this while, uh, while we're talking. In case you don't know, I'm using a block so it's taped on the edge, so I have to peel off the top page so I can, uh, I can work here. Anyway, so what I wanted to get going on today, I was thinking 
What are we gonna do? I was thinking that it's Advent, technically, right? It's four weeks out from Christmas. Advent starts four weeks out from Christmas. And I was like, you know, maybe we'll do something Christmassy, but it's still pretty far from Christmas, actually. And, you know, if I'm respecting the, like, liturgical calendar, it's like, it's not Christmas right now. It's Advent, which has its own vibe and situation. And I was thinking about a few things that relate to the themes of Advent, Christmas, and things like that. And I had a few ideas. I was poking around. I'm always sitting at my table. You can imagine me sitting at my table surrounded by books like that. I'm just leafing through, looking for, like, what's the topic going to be. And I was thinking about, you know, I was like, what's like really the essence of like Advent and also like early winter for me, you know, I've been looking out of my window, I don't know if it snowed where you have, but sometimes I look out last like few days at least and there's this like simple like flat snowfall and it just is so like homey and it makes me think of like simple things, it actually makes me kind of think of the time period we were just looking at. And one way or another, I was thinking about, you know, like faith and that really being the essence of sort of the Advent season, you know, the birth of Jesus is like imminent, hovering in the air, you know. And I thought about how we did the allegory of faith by Vermeer a few weeks ago. And I thought we should do our own allegory of faith. In case you missed that episode, I actually happen to have the painting right here. I need to send this to someone. Someone asked me to send it to them, so I have to do it. But I haven't done it yet. So we hit Vermeer's Allegory of Faith, and we kind of copied it and did it in our own way. This one turned out pretty dope, actually. It's one of the better ones uh, that we've done on the fly so far. But I thought we should do our own Allegory of Faith. And I just so happened to have this book right here that I pulled up last week, which is -na -na -na, Dictionary of Subjects and Symbols in Art. And I thought, that's perfect. I have to look up in the Dictionary of Subjects and Symbols in Art, Faith. Uh, in case you don't know, so some people some people know about art that hang out here, some people don't, some people have been watching for a while, some people haven't. Um, an allegory, it's basically just an image that kind of means a larger idea. So you get allegories of charity, virtue, faith, hope, all that stuff. Um, I pulled up a few, so we're going to look at a few in a second. But before we do, I just want to read the entry here because it's pretty awesome. And it's definitely what made me want to do this right now. I'm actually going to grab a pen also because we are just going to write down really quick what we're going to use in our image. So we'll just kind of build it together on the fly. Uh, I kind of have an idea of what I want in my mind. Once you hear what this says, you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, so in this book, it lays out how different themes are represented in art. And here's what it says for faith. With hope and charity, one of the theological virtues, so someone mentioned the rosary before. Actually, it's a cool connection if you if you use the rosary. There's the three beads in the beginning for the three theological virtu virtues, that being faith, hope, and charity. So that's what that's referring to here. It's kind of a good tie-in. Uh, so with hope and charity, one of the three theological virtues, and like them, represented as a woman with identifying attributes. Faith is usually seen as one of the group of three. In Gothic art, she occupies the place of honor on the right hand of Christ and holds a cross, perhaps a chalice. So let's write down, let's write down this stuff as we go along. So she's got a chalice or a cross. Cross or chalice. Attributes that she retains later. She may have a font, a reminder of the rite of initiation into the Chris Christian faith. So by font, that means a baptismal font. And we are actually going to use that for sure. Uh, she is opposed by the vice of idolatry, represented as a man worshiping a monkey. So you know, obviously, we are going to use that. I mean, come on. Is it your first day here? Obviously, we're going to have a man worshiping a monkey. I mean, do I need to tell you why that's dope? Uh, a symbol of paganism in the Middle Ages or in the early Renaissance as a man with a cord tied to his neck, the other end of which is attached to an idol. So we'll use that also. We have a very wide canvas here, so I'm thinking of how to use the width also. Uh, this isn't much longer. It's just like a few more sentences. In counter-reformation art, faith may carry an open book on which lies a cross, showing that it represents the scriptures. So a book, obviously, can I do one painting without a book? Probably not. Her foot rests on a stone block, C cube. So we're going to use that. A cube is kind of cool because uh, in different esoterica stuff, a cube represents earth anyway. So it's kind of fitting. We'll talk about that a little bit. Representing her unshakable foundation. She sometimes holds a candle, the light of faith. Candle is perfect. An attribute that she shares with charity. A helmet protects her against the assault of heretics. That's pretty awesome. Obviously, we're going to do that too. Uh, and her characteristic gesture is to hold her hand to her breast. So yeah, you're going to see all the images I'm about to pull up. Uh, they have her hand to her breast, just like you saw in the painting we just showed, just like in Vermeer's. There's probably some reasons why she's touching her heart. Kind of makes sense, right? Anyway, so I read all that and I was like, okay, a woman 
in a helmet with a candle with her foot on a cube with a chalice holding a baptismal font and behind her is a man worshiping a monkey and maybe in the back also is a guy chained to an idol and I was like, dude, that's killer. Obviously, we're 200% doing that. And I tried to pull up a Renaissance painting. I thought it would be easy to pull up a Renaissance painting that would have all this stuff, but I couldn't find one. I couldn't find one Renaissance image that had all that stuff. So I pulled up a few paintings. We'll look at it super quick. We're going to start painting in like a few minutes, but I just want to pull this up because I think it's worthwhile. Okay, so I'm going to transition over to my desktop camera. Boom, boom. You got the Mandelbrot view. All right, cool. So really quick, we'll just look at a few images of Faith here. We're going to hit like some of them. In every one, she has like one or two of the things, but in none of them does she have all of them. So here she's holding what I presume to be a baptismal font and a cross. Here, naked woman. At some point, everyone likes to be naked in art, not sure why. What I really like here is this angel up here putting this little halo on her. So we'll probably do that. I really like that because then it's kind of like faith is being illumined or glorified is really the word I should use, is being glorified by this like emissary of God, that being the angel. So I think that's really dope. Uh, here we have one. This has a bunch of stuff going on, but not everything from our little uh, narrative here. She has the Eucharist with the chalice. One thing you're going to notice as we go through these images, we're not going to do this because uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily like totally, I'm not totally on board with it, though I get it. She's often wearing like a blindfold or her eyes are covered like this. Um, I guess that's kind of obvious, the symbolism, because faith is like, you know, she can't see sort of the object of her faith. You know, religion involves like poking through this veil, I guess, but... I kind of don't really like that. I kind of think of faith more as like an illuminator. It's more of like a guide. It's more of like something that illuminates the darkness. I don't think of faith herself as like not being able to see. So we're not going to do that. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Boom. Pretty cool one. Now we have a realistic angel crowning faith with these golden laurels right here. I'm going to try and go through these kind of quickly. This one I thought was pretty cool. Uh, this is from some like roof painting. I forget the technical term. It's from a fresco on the roof. But here she's leaning on the baptismal font and we got this like military angel giving her the papal tiara. Pretty good time. You can see from the colors here, this is Rococo, in case you're into art history and stuff. Another one, Faith with the Chalice. We get it. This one I thought was kind of cool. This one is actually not called Faith. It's called uh, the Triumph of Prudence. No, it's called... It's something, something like the triumph of prudence over virtue. I mean, the triumph of, triumph of prudence over sin or something like that. So you can see here, up here, we got this woman. She's faith, obviously. And this angel is sort of pointing towards, you know, this heavenly realm over here where people are being like anointed or something like that. And then down at the bottom, there's this kind of cool detail. Near her feet, there's this globe, right? But if you look in the globe, this is very like... Um, Bronzino painting. Bronzino in the in the Renaissance and Mannerism used this kind of image sometimes. There's this mask. It's like a human mask over here in the globe. And the globe that she has her foot on is actually chained. And there's a chain leading over to this guy's foot. Obviously, I, I suspect he represents like sin or carnal nature or something. But the image of the mask is so creepy. And oftentimes in an allegorical image like this, it'll be used to represent like the false self or or lies or really just deceit in general. Um, a mask is inherently deceptive. So that was kind of a cool detail down at the bottom of this painting. Let's keep it going. Also, he's offering her an apple. Just a little pretty obvious like biblical symbolism here. Pretty obvious. So I'm not going to go into that one too much. Let's keep it moving. Another one, woman with the chalice and everything. This is kind of cool. In the Renaissance, uh, little dogs start to represent faith and fidelity, really. They represent fidelity, really like loyalty because dogs are loyal. But look at this little dog. It's kind of cute over here in the corner. In uh, Titian's, um, what's her name? Venus of Urbino, there's a little dog because it's a marriage portrait and it represents fidelity, loyalty. That's what fidelity means in case you don't know. Um, over here, this is more of like a memento mori setup. She's faith, you know, not really perturbed thinking about death and stuff like that. More Rococo stuff. I feel like we get the point though. This I thought was kind of cool. This is an image of faith. It's one of these marble sculptures where the guy like flexes crazy hard by making the woman behind a veil of translucent marble. Obviously I'm down for artistic flexing, but symbolically, we already talked about it. We're not gonna, not gonna veil our faith. And this one's pretty cool, too. This is the last one we'll look at because I feel like we've seen enough here. Uh, this one's also called Triumph. This one's similar. It's like Triumph of Virtue over Vanity or something. So we have this woman here. She represents virtue. I thought this fit in with the images of faith stuff. 
And then down at the bottom of the image is all this, uh, you know, gold and wealth and things that she doesn't care about. Fitting with the globe under her foot being used in an interesting way, maybe we'll do something like that. Here we have the globe and there's this snake. There's like this dragon, little like a uh, dragon, like perched around the globe. So it's kind of cool. It's probably like a fallen world situation or something like that. So one more thing I wanted to quickly poke into. So just because uh, obviously as a weirdo, kind of mystically inclined guy, I am into weird coincidences and stuff like that. And today, someone sent me this book. They just DM me on Twitter. I don't know if I should say their name. I never want to like shout anybody out. They were like, hey, you might find this interesting. I, literally as I was prepping the show. And I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see, obviously. But this, the book is called... Well, sorry, I'm zooming in too much. The book is called... Iconologia, or Moral Emblems, by Caesar Rippa wherein are expressed various, various images of virtue, vices, arts, humors, elements, and celestial bodies. So it's literally a book all about allegories and how all these things are represented. So I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. And I poked in here, and faith isn't in this. Oh, it's from like the 1650s, I think. I think it's from the 1650s or so. So I poked in here, uh, sort of a divine coincidence, and faith was not in here. But then I thought, you know what probably is in here is religion, which is tangentially related to faith. So let's go check it out. Uh, religion is figure 260, so I'm just going to quickly scroll way down. I know it's kind of unprofessional for me to be just hardcore scrolling through this book, but I thought, what a cool coincidence. This guy sent me a book from the 1600s, literally about what the painting show is going to be about tonight. And then we'll get it going. So it's 260, we got to go, go a little bit further. Are we there yet? Almost, 247, we are almost there. It's the next page, perfect. So religion, the book's not crazy high quality, but I mean, it's from the 1650s, so what do you want? Figure 260, religion, a woman with her face veiled, fire in her left hand, and in her right a book, and a cross, an elephant by her side. Veiled because she has always been secret. It's kind of interesting. The cross is the victorious banner of true religion. The book is the scripture. The elephant is an emblem of religion. He adoring the sun and stars. So in case that sounds really weird to you, and I'm going to show you the picture right now. There's a picture too. Um, in case that sounds really strange to you, why would they put an elephant in? Uh, and kind of like medieval and like post-medieval times, they have all these different interesting ideas about like what animals do. Um, so like, for example, you know, there are stories about like a rooster and how a rooster is the only animal able to scare a lion. So in images like this, you'll see a rooster and it represents, you know, being like the ultimate like masculine force or something. So I suspect, you know, wherever this guy's from or, you know, somehow it had crept in probably some story or folk biology about elephants, like observing the sun and stars or something. And that's why there's an elephant over here included with her. So, so it was kind of interesting and kind of a strange coincidence that that guy sent me that on the exact day that I needed it. Kind of cool. Anyway, though, let's get it going. I'm going to pull up the last thing. Perfect. And now we're ready to go. Let's do this thing. Just want to make sure uh, people in the chat aren't like, yo, I can't see what you're talking about. Okay, cool. Those buildings Faith is leaning on are baptistries. The font is actually the pool of water. That's cool, actually. Um... We're probably going to use a, a baptistry, though, actually. Since, since, since the designation was made, we probably, we probably actually are going to use a baptistry. But let's do it! That was a pretty long intro, but I hope that was interesting. And let's get going. So I am going to do what I do every week. I'm going to lay down a little bit of a border. But I want to push also, as we're going this week, I want to push the push a little bit of the winter winter color scheme, a little bit of the winter element. It's not just an informational show. It is also partially an art show. So I'm going to quickly throw down, this pen's a little bit dead, but I actually thought it would give me a nice effect. Just putting down sort of a light border. Sometimes the border is so heavy and then it affects uh, what we can and can't do with the image. So I'm just going to throw this down. And what I'm thinking is woman in the middle with the details we talked about. Uh, I want to push like how we're painting a little bit. I want to push a little bit of the looseness and like the color flow and stuff like that. And then the background, I always try to put too much in. I always try and put a little bit too much in. So we'll definitely commit to the man worshiping a monkey. And it'll be cool because if in the front, if we get like hardcore winter colors in the front, he could be like contrasted with like red and kind of like flamey, fiery colors in the back. Um, or we could put him like in darkness or something. That would be pretty sick. But they definitely saw certain trends on the horizon. Anyway, so we'll throw on this last wall and we'll get this going. 
Um, I really like the allegorical images. I always have. Uh, I used to hang out in this place. It was a public place. And they had these sculptures. And there were these beautiful women, the sculptures. And they were holding some things and, you know, little stuff like that. And well, I've always been into art, obviously. But I just never really thought about it. You know, you go hang out somewhere. And then uh, you see the art there. But, you know, sometimes you don't think about it, oddly enough, even though you spend your whole life doing and thinking about art. And long story short, one day I realized I was just looking at them. And I was like, oh, this one's holding wheat. This one's holding an urn. This one's holding uh, a flute. And the last one was holding, uh, I forget what the last one was holding, but I basically realized that they were earth, air, fire, and water. And I was like, wow, I've come to this spot, you know, 200, 300 times. And I never actually realized that there's these like allegorical images here. So since then, I've always liked it. It also kind of naturally marries my, uh, my real inclination. I'm, I call myself a painter, but really I'm an illustrator and that I like to merge visuals with ideas, I like to represent ideas in pictures. So obviously the allegory stuff is right up that alley. So let's do this though, that's enough talking. I got our little sheets over here. And if we're doing the head first, what we need to remember is she's wearing a helmet, as the book said, to shield her from the heresies. That's pretty dope. And the spirit of wintry stuff, I kind of want to kick out a color that I don't normally use. So this is called Prussian blue. I never use this color. Um, I only have it because I had to order this paint set from Japan at a time when the factory was like not making paint or something. Who knows, you know, who knows why and how things happen. Um, but since I have it here, let's uh, let's try it out a little bit. I might've used it on the show last week, but either way, I never really like break it out too hard. I'm just gonna grab an index card so you can just see how it looks really quick. This, I think, would be a nice, really wintry color. Unlike the other blues, it's really like cold and icy. Um, it's almost like a chemical blue. I think we did break this out last week. I was saying it's the same kind of blue they use for like Egyptian uh, pottery, like that faience and stuff like that. Later, it comes into Northern Europe. You can kind of see if we were on like a white background, we'd be getting that kind of Northern Euro blue and white pottery vibe. But let's roll with this at first. I'm not gonna say we're gonna do the whole painting in that, but let's roll with that at first. And if we're going to put her in a helmet, it might be kind of tight to put her in profile. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And uh, let's just go for it. I'm going to kind of not really think too much, honestly, about the style of the helmet. I'm just going to put it in. I guess after looking at all those images with you just now, I kind of am thinking about those sort of uh, excessive kind of late Renaissance, almost like Baroque helmets. So that's, that might be the style that we go for. It's gonna come down here, and then they kind of come down this way. That'll be enough, because if it's a woman, we want to be able to see her hair. That's also part of, the, part of what I'm thinking about right now. And we're gonna make it like sweeping style. That's what I was really thinking of. If you go to an armor museum, sometimes you see these kind of like sweeping, like oddly shaped helmets. That's what I was going for right here. Boom. Perfect. It's a perfect shape actually. And I said I want to push like the style a little bit, so I just kind of want to go a little bit faster and looser, honestly, and just see see how it comes together. So I'm just going to quickly shade this in. I'm just going to go for it. If you've been watching the show, you know we always get stuck on like the details in the very beginning. I check the clock and I'm like, oh my god, we've only done like one thing. So let's see what happens if we push it a little bit. I don't want to jinx it, but we haven't had like a bad painting yet the whole time, so. <laughs> Shouldn't jinx it, but when this dries, I'll come back in and put like a pattern in here, you know, kind of like when you see those like really elaborate like etched helmets and stuff. But for now, for now, this will be fine. And I'm just going to come in and put her face in. I don't want it to be too big. I'm already kind of feeling like maybe I made this too big, so I might like dial back the size of her face a little bit and just throw it in like this. When I'm putting in the woman's face, I kind of can feel that I have like two options open before me. One is like kind of like more realistic and the other is more graphic. And I'm kind of just going to lean into the more graphic one right now. Mostly because it gives me a lot more options, honestly, in terms of how I want to play certain cards. If I put in kind of like a cute girl face and it's like shaded and stuff, then I'm like locked into that mode and that way of being. But if it's graphic, then I can, you know, push things a little bit more in whatever direction I want. If you don't know what I mean, you'll see. Uh, okay, and I want her to have long hair, and I'm going to put in dark hair. Why not? Dark hair is nice and wintry. And just like I was hoping, I kind of wanted it to bleed in a little bit here. What I want to push right now while we're doing this, I'll look at the chat in a second in case anyone's trying to tell me anything. 
but uh, I want to push like when when the wet elements are touching other wet elements, they start to like kick up and bleed into each other, and it, you start to get kind of a cool look. So that's what I really want to push right now. It's even just little things, like you can see here. I put the darkness in, and just a tiny bit, it folded into the helmet a little bit. That probably seems like inconsequential, but at the end, when you're looking at the whole overall image, what actually gives you as the viewer the quality of the image is little details like that. Um, sort of the overall like surface quality, I guess you could say. So that's one thing that we have going on in the back of our minds right now. And we'll think about what she's holding, but sometimes when I put in the hair, I get kind of worried because the hair could easily like take up some like crucial space or something, but I'm just gonna go for it. I'm just gonna give her kind of long, simple hair. Maybe it's because we just looked at that, you know, what was it, history of early Euro book, but I think they're just throwing in simple shapes and stuff might be the way to go for this one. Then we can push the shading and things like that. Off the bat, I'm already thinking if she has a halo, what color that's gonna be, that's gonna decide a lot of things. We don't have to go with yellow for the halo like every time. And yeah, with the Prussian blue, you can see what I was talking about. I actually wanna push these like fades as much as possible. So I'm even gonna come back. Yeah, look at that. That's exactly what I'm talking about right here. I wonder, hmm, just wanna let you know what I'm thinking. I was thinking I could even come up here in the hair and take out a little bit and give it a little texture here, but actually I kind of, kind of torn about that. Where, where you, oh fuck. It's fine. <laughs> Where you have large variances in tone, your eye is like drawn there like a magnet. So if I started to put in streaks and stuff in here like I would normally do, I think it would kind of distract the eye. So actually I'm not gonna do that. Um, in terms of her eyes, it would be cool if I could get one eye closed and one eye open. That would like really fit the theme of like faith. You know, she has one eye like looking inwards and one eye kind of looking outwards, but I chose to put her in profile. So actually, I probably can't do that. Um, so I'm gonna go with open eye. If we if we if we shunned away the whole veil thing that hard, then we gotta go open eye. Even though I really want to put the closed eye. I don't know. Maybe I'll compromise with the classic veil symbolism by putting the closed eye. I'm really torn. I'm really torn. Uh, so I just won't do it now. Put in her neck right here. Okay. And. Let's see, just learned that the Catholic Church recognizes the sacraments of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Is it weird that I'm thinking that automatically makes ortho the safer bet? That's funny. Yeah, people do say that actually. People say like, why not just be Orthodox? They recognize our sacraments. That is funny. I have been thinking a lot about certain like mystical theology things that we'll talk about. Um, okay, so I wanna throw in her neck and I'm gonna put in kind of like modest clothing, I guess. I painted this woman the other day and my wife came in and was like, she's not very modestly dressed. It's like, wow, not trad. Not trad. And let's see, I'll get in like one of her hands and then I can kind of loosen up and like start talking about other stuff. But I just want to lay the solid scaffolding foundation before I start letting my thoughts drift, which I do enjoy. So we'll kind of put in her shoulders. The way I paint them in gives us a lot of options. We can have like stuff on her shoulders and things like that. Nice, this is good so far. This is good. And actually, because of some certain things I've been reading, I actually am gonna go with the closed eye because it'll kind of be like her eyes are closed to like the world of the senses. So like this inward sense going on. Could have made it a little bit bolder so it reads a little bit more. Perfect, it's perfect. Okay. Um, and let's see, once I get one more arm in, I can actually start to drift and talk about other topics. Okay, so we want her holding a baptismal situation. I was corrected, which I enjoy, in the chat. Uh, the font is, of course, the fountain. That's why it's called that. Um, and I'm thinking of a baptistry. Like in Florence, they have the baptistry, and then inside is the baptismal font. Um, but I kind of want to put a uh, baptismal building. So we're just going to go with the building. Uh, we're going to buck a few traditions here, I guess. And I'm gonna kind of do the style that I often do, get that like 400 AD, kind of 1000 AD situation going in. So I'm going to, it really didn't give myself a lot of room here, but it's not a big deal. We'll put in this kind of like generic arm. <laughs> Honestly, it gives me a lot of room to like wiggle around because I'm not sure exactly how uh, the building's gonna be. We'll come in with the hand 
Maybe we'll put a wedding ring on her also. That would be kind of a good like symbolism, right? We'll come in with the hand. I've been really leaning in more to this like hand all together thing too. Okay, and we'll have her holding the building right here. I'd like it to be bigger, but we gotta make gotta make a whole picture, you know, so everything can't be exactly how I want it to be. Uh, and I'm gonna shade in her a little bit. The hand's a little small, but with the body and everything, it'll look fine. In case you want more insight into what I'm thinking right now, it's just that when you do an a person like this, what always happens is at the bottom, you get to the feet, and then they're, if they go off the page, then it's kind of like, all right, well, it's ruined then, basically. So I uh, wanted to be careful and give myself enough room for a building here, but also make sure I had enough room coming down over this way. I'm gonna shade her face in a little bit. Cool. And yeah, otherwise I, uh, let's see, I just wanna see if the shading is gonna show up. Yeah, it's perfect. So let's see if I can tease out a little bit of the blue in the hair over here. Cool. Cool. Nice. I wanna get a little of the shading coming out of her neck too. Perfect. Perfect. That looks dope. That looks dope actually. Nice. Um, okay. And I'm thinking, I'll just paint it in since I'm thinking about it right now. We'll have her holding a candle like this up to her face. And then actually what I'll do is I'll paint in the halo of the candle. We'll probably get some of that light onto her face and then we'll put in her halo and see what we want to do. So I'm just going to come down. And whenever you do that bend, honestly, this first bend, you always want to make sure it's not too big. I, I always put it too low. And then it's like her arm is like nine feet long. Cool. So I'm gonna come down here. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. And I always like to talk about what I'm reading on the show actually. Uh, it's kind of nice because the show is like one week apart always from the last show. So I always, I'm always like in like just a little bit of a different place than I was last week. It's like the perfect amount of time. Like if the shows were like two or three days apart, I'd be like, eh, I'm kind of still, kind of still in the same town. But when it's a week apart, it's like I'm just a little bit further along. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is uh, I want to make her holding this candle. So what you can do if you're drawing people and stuff like that is you can actually. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, wait, how would her hand be? You know, would you see her thumb or would you see her hand? So what I'm actually doing, you can't see, I'm doing it off camera, is I'm just putting my hand in the pose that I'm gonna paint her, her hand in, and I'm noticing how my hand is, and then I'm gonna paint it in. So what I'm noticing is the side part of my hand. You can actually do this if you're watching. You can just hold the like, pose like her and, and hold it up, and then imagine there's a mirror over to your left. Um, I'm noticing that the side part of my hand that comes down from the pinky is sort of like the forward-facing part. That's like what you would really see. And then the top four fingers are coming in kind of like a paw. I'm like imagining that I'm holding like a huge candle. So I'm gonna come in and my fingers, the most important thing is my fingers are pointed towards me, actually. It's kind of hard to parse out directions when you're thinking that you're three dimensional, the picture's 2D, how's it orient? So I always try and just think about, okay, my hand is pointed towards me. So I'm gonna just remember that and I'm gonna come up. Okay, cool. And put it in. And if it doesn't look good, I can kind of just fudge it anyway, so. But I'm thinking that this is that kind of side of the hand where the pinky is, and then it comes up and over. Perfect. It'll be good enough for this style, honestly. Just come around, come around. Perfect. And it's a little bit further out than I wanted, so even though it doesn't actually totally fit the perspective, I'm just going to throw in, throw in the thumb right there. Maybe that was a bad call. Maybe it wasn't, but we'll see. And I'm going to put in a tall candle. I guess it'll be kind of above her. Now we're gonna start getting some other colors in the mix. Let's do this. Uh, so Advent style, I mean, I don't know if you guys are intuiting, but obviously it's gotta be like a red candle, right? Does anything else say Advent more than that? Okay, I'm gonna grab, uh, let's go with cadmium red. I don't want it to be like super bright. I feel like it should be like kind of dark, right? It's like an Advent candle. My wife has the house, has a bunch of candles around right now, actually. Let's see if this is dark enough though. It's not that dark. Should I go darker than that? I have this color called Spectrum Red. Another one of those colors I never use. It's not a real pigment, it's a 
color that's mixed by like the paint companies. All right, let's see. This is kind of actually exactly the color I was thinking of. It's a little bit more wintry. That like dark red. Nice. So yeah, what I was reading this week, I never, I always say reading, but honestly, like I don't have that much time to read because I, especially in the holidays, I'm trying to, you know, keep the art situation going. Um, but I checked out this book and I actually, I, I read this book a long time ago, but I kind of hit it again and the title is sick. I don't know if I ever mentioned it on the show, but it's called Christianity as Mystical Fact and it's by Rudolf Steiner. I don't know if we talked about Rudolf Steiner on the show before, but it's kind of interesting because I'm kind of like a, obviously sort of like a weirdo, esoterically inclined, kind of like tripped out guy in a way, but obviously I am oriented in the Christian persuasion, let's say. And look, you can see the color, the blue is like coming up here. That's kind of like exactly what I was talking about. I'm going to make the top of this candle flat though. And I suspect I'll come back in with like a brighter red and, uh, I'll have the light kind of like illuminating the candle itself. Because right now it is kind of dark, but we'll see. And it's a pretty dope book, honestly, because it's all about like the whole structure of the book is basically he takes this perspective. I don't agree with like everything he says, obviously, as if I need to say that every time. But the whole the book, Christianity is Mystical Fact, he basically posits that like Christianity itself and like the like structure of it and nature of it and like it, it itself um, – is like a mystical fact in the same way that you have like scientific facts. It's like it's like a fact of the spiritual realm. And he kind of structures the whole book by going back and sort of talking about how like prior to the incarnation, it's perfect for Advent that we're talking about this actually, um, the structure of like people doing spiritual seeking and trying to go deeper into learning about like the spiritual realms and stuff um, was these like weird mystery cults and like mystery religions and like initiations and like, you know, people would go to like Babylon or Egypt or, well, Babylon has its own like biblical context, right? Probably, probably wouldn't have been going there, but you know, Egypt or Greece or, you know, basically the structure of it was these like mystery religions and you'd have to be like initiated. So it goes through the whole book laying out like these ideas and these philosophers and their views and, sort of how it dovetails with like little aspects of like Christianity and stuff. And then at the end of the book, what he basically says is that after the incarnation, it's kind of like, um, what was this like mystery that the structure of it kind of like went away that, that before you had to be like initiated and, uh, it was kept for like secret, like spiritual seekers. But after the incarnation, it became something kind of for everyone and that it no longer was the case that it was, uh, that the, that, knowledge of the spiritual realm was kept only for, you know, people doing stuff like that, people being initiated, you know, these secret initiatory priesthoods and stuff. He's like, you know, when the incarnation happened, it basically was opening knowledge of the spiritual realm to everyone. And it became like a mass thing that was intended for like all of humanity. And uh, I thought it was pretty awesome, honestly. Um, like I said, it's not like I feel like whenever I mention anyone, I like have to qualify. Like I don't agree with like every single thing the person is talking about or whatever. Um, Cause you know, I'm sure someone could go and find some Steiner thing that like, I don't agree with, you know, stupid caveat, but in general, I thought the structure of it was pretty cool actually. Um, and I really kind of liked that idea because that is something that I personally, I don't want to say wrestle with because I enjoy it, but that is something that I've always found kind of interesting about uh, Christianity. You know, it's like, it has that really interesting, has this really interesting element of um, what I just described, opening up like knowledge of the spiritual realm in a way that is for everyone. And that, that kind of tension, I guess, I guess there's kind of a tension there, is kind of something that I've always had lurking around my general spiritual experience in a way because it always has kind of interested me. You know, I grew up in kind of like an atheist place. Everyone was basically an atheist, like whether they like literally were or not. And I always found it so intriguing, even just so like my spiritual life was always like private. You know what I mean? Like I would go in my room and like read about like God or like, you know, anything really, even when it was Buddhism, it doesn't really matter. The point is that it was always private for me. Like this little like weird, weird, like secret thing I had going on. And just the fact that other people had like, you know, even just stuff like, you know, saying a prayer with your family or like talking about God, like with your family, I thought that was just so interesting. You know, it probably sounds stupid to you if, if you grew up with like a spiritual family. 
but it was so interesting to me because I was always like, you know, yeah, like spiritual things kind of do have this like uh, deeper nature that I feel like isn't really naturally accessible to everyone. But at the same time, it kind of is. I don't know, I'm kind of like rambling now, but there's something really interesting about that. It's always been kind of like a tension I've had in like my spiritual life. I wouldn't really call it a tension, you know. I guess I could I guess I could more more clearly state what I'm trying to say in that, you know, it's like to learn about theology, to learn about like the nature of God and all this stuff is like quite the endeavor. Like, you know what I mean? The average person who like, you know, works with me at the supermarket. I, I don't work in the supermarket now, but I used to, you know, the average person working with me there, like, you know, I think they're a great person, but they're not, they're not going to come home and crack open like a, a thousand page book that like, no offense to them, I can barely make my way through. Right. But at the same time, they have this system that like opens up knowledge of the spiritual world to them just by virtue of, you know, them being like a good person and being inclined to uh, partake of such things. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. Anyway, probably talk more about that. So I want to, I want to get this like bleeding out from the flame right here, honestly. So I'm trying to do right now. It's kind of cool. I thought it would just bleed into this like yellow halo that we got going on. Okay. Did anyone at me or anything? No. Someone said it isn't purple for Advent. Yeah, it might be. Good point, actually. Maybe we'll get some purple in. Purple's not really very December-y for me, though, but maybe we can work it in. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm also going to grab some of this yellow, and I'm going to just... I've been doing this recently in Photoshop, in my Photoshop images. I'm just going to, like, get some of that glow. I'm just going to take the glow and, like, straight up put it on her. So, like, the candle is, like, glowing. Gonna throw it down right there in the front. Boom, there we go. You kind of could feel that one. You could feel like the light of the candle like become manifest there a little bit. Perfect. And I'm feeling it so much, I'm actually just gonna put some of it on her hand too. Just a little bit. Yeah, ah, you, you literally can feel the candle glowing right now, can't you? I mean, that's tight. Um, okay, I'm gonna come in here with the blue. So yeah, because of that, you know, it's sort of like a natural bridge. Like I said, I've read the book before, but I listened to the audio book while I was packing up um, orders and stuff here. Not, not orders, no one's ordered them yet, but while I was packing up stuff here. And I was like, yeah, true. And it really just got me thinking like so much. We'll talk about that more. Anyway, big decision right now is if I'm going to paint in her halo and what I'm going to do about that. I mean, I'm going to paint in some kind of like halo or something, but thing is actually, once I put in the halo, this is already looking pretty dope. Once I put in the halo, uh, if I fill it in or, you know, what's going on there, it's kind of like a big decision. So I'm just going to hold off on that for a second. Um, we want to make her holding a baptistry. So I'm going to pick another color. I'm kind of vibing on like the things being different colors thing. Um, but I'm still trying to push the winter color situation. So basically I have two options. Do we make it lighter than this blue, like a light blue or something that could be kind of tight? Or do we make it darker? And then I could get some brown in or something like that. I'm kind of torn there, honestly. Uh, if I make it blue, well, hmm. If I make it blue, then we're going to really have the wintry vibe going on. But then it's blue on blue. I don't want things to start getting lost. It's going to be smaller, so I really want that clarity. So I'm going to go with brown. Let's go with the brown. The burnt umber is very brown. This is literally like dead tree color, so this is perfect. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a short walk from that to me being like, oh, you know, I sh there's a lot of cool quotes in that book, like uh, like Clement of Alexandria and all these guys. And I was like, oh, I should really go more into that stuff. So just something random I've been thinking about. Anyway, so now we're going to paint in. Maybe we'll talk more about that. It kind of dovetails with like, the Neoplatonism and stuff like that in a weird way, like I was talking about in the pre-show, but we'll see how it goes. Anyway, right here. Uh, so... If you were here for the pre-show, we saw those buildings where it was like in that kind of flat perspective. And that's kind of what I want to do right now. Um, there's a convention in some European Christian architecture that baptistries are eight-sided. I'm sure it's not always the case, but sometimes it is the case. I mentioned the baptistry in Florence before. If you've been there, if you've been to the Duomo, there's the Duomo. That's the building with the red dome in Florence in Italy, in Tuscany specifically, in case you don't know. And then in front of that is the baptistry where they would baptize people. And it has eight sides. Uh, so it's so the first one that came in my mind. So I want to do that. So instead of showing the front of the building and then having the side come out of it like we saw in that uh, early Euro book, I'm going to 
put it so we're seeing the top in that flat perspective and then the rest of the building is coming out from it. So I'm just going to paint in an eight-sided shape as the roof of this building, which means I'm going to go one, two, three, four, perfect. And then I'm going to come in and put those sides in here. One. I'm tapering them a little bit in just so it doesn't look like a circle. So you can see I actually bent that one quite a bit. But I'm bending them a little bit so your eye definitely doesn't read them as a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I actually had to count. I was like, shit, did I make them six? Okay, and I'm going to come down here with the straight lines just coming out of it. And this is going to be our baptistry. Perfect. Boom. Perfect. And fittingly, there's very little chance that anyone that came <laughs> that was not watching the show that saw this would know it's a baptistry. But we'll see what we can do about that. But for now, it's all good. And I'm going to put in these windows. So I thought I might push the window style, but I just wanted to put them in one or two in flat just to make sure it looked like a building. I really did not give myself a lot of space here, but it's all good. Um, we are embracing the beauty of imperfection. Now it's a Japanese painting show. We're all wabi-sabi style in here now. Um, okay, I'm going to put a little bit of a trim. That'll also make it look a little bit more like a building. Just this one, two, three. Perfect. When it's a little drier, I'll bring the shading down a little bit. That'll make it look a little bit more like a building. But otherwise... Um, I hadn't really thought about what I was going to put on the top, but now that I'm looking at it, I mean, yeah, we could just put like a baptism pool up here or something. So I think that's what we're obviously going to do right now. All right. People are discussing cooking in the chat. Honestly, I'm so down. Dude, I've been going so hard on the cooking. You guys have no idea. It's been so sick. Kind of could force it to fit in with uh, Advent and Faith and stuff, but it kind of doesn't. But yeah, I've just been going really hard on that too. I guess it fits in with like winter. Winter, honestly, I said I wouldn't fit in, but winter honestly does have a very like, I try not use this word so much because it's very cliche, but winter does have a very like esoteric flavor to it just because it's so obviously about like reflecting and like the internal life and solitude and the material elements, like the material world outside, like kind of turning against you. And then that naturally makes us like have to come together like survive this like dark time together so it really is one of the more like spiritual seasons it's a very like arbitrary designation but uh it definitely is honestly in summer it's like yeah we're gonna go to the beach i mean that has like some esoteric dimension but it's not like winter in my opinion when i lived in new york i used to love being there in the winter because it's like the only time people are nice to each other honestly it's like everyone's collectively like surviving this like horrible horrible thing together and it like forces people to like band together in this way Okay, so I tried to put this little like baptismal pool up at the top and I'm going to just pick up a little bit and I might even put a little bit of that yellow light in there, just like reflecting in there. That could be really dope and it kind of doesn't look like a bowl. I want it to look like a bowl, but it kind of doesn't. So just to try and make it look like a 3D object, I'm going to put this shadow behind it. It's too small, but you know, whatever. It's not a big deal. It's actually, it's actually not bad. I should try and shade in here a little bit, but I'm really worried about just losing like all readability there. So that's about as good as it's gonna get. Actually, that's kind of cool. It looks like the water's like spilling out. All right, cool. Uh, I'm gonna keep going on her clothes. We're gonna keep moving it down a little bit. Um, but let's see, what else did I wanna talk about? I mean, the faith thing is interesting. We're doing an allegory of faith. I guess I should talk about that a little bit just because it kind of does fit in with, okay, let's see, I want to get, okay. I should think about how I'm going to do this right now. Um, so for her lower half, you can kind of see, we don't have that much room here. Ideally we would have like a lot more, but we don't, but it's not a big deal. Um, because I could come in and put, so her waist coming down with the leg coming, oh shit, it's fine, <laughs> it's okay. The leg coming up 
and then the foot and then the foot's on something, but it's going to be kind of cramming a lot of stuff uh, into the space. So I don't think, I don't think we're going to do that. I think what we're actually going to do is a little bit less typical, but it kind of fits. I'm going to come in here. Okay, perfect. And I'm going to put her in this pose. I've been using this pose a lot actually in my images. And it's going to be kind of like she's wearing a dress. Perfect. And her legs come in here. Perfect. Like she's sitting on the floor. That's kind of like the pose that I'm going for, which actually is kind of perfect for Faith. Maybe we'll make her sitting like on a rock or, you know, we can have her sitting on something. But the point is that perfect. It's going to come in like this. And I'm going to come in like she's wearing like these big robes. Perfect. One more fold here. I'll kind of come up over here. Perfect. And then I'm going to put the cube down here instead of, you know, instead of having her sitting on it. I think that's kind of a good idea. And maybe her feet are going to come off the page, but it's not a big deal. Perfect. It's actually perfect. I can roll with that. Although, so what I'm thinking, just so you know, is that it's kind of obvious that I <laughs> really wanted to fit it in this line. So it's kind of like chump status. I don't want to make it look that obvious. So to make it less obvious that I was trying to squeeze that in the line, I'm going to have the other foot coming out. So you're seeing the top of one foot and the side of the other. I'm kind of cool with that, actually. And then to make her pose a little less awkward, right now it's a little, it's it's not bad, but it's a little like, okay, it's a little weird. Uh, I'm gonna have her sitting on something. We'll def we'll have her sitting on like a big something, and then that will like equalize out uh, like the weight of her like pose. Uh, since we're kind of going in that like flat style, it's not so much of an issue. Uh, it actually kind of like pushes the style a little bit more because it makes it more like informational. But what are you gonna do? Anyway, um, it said in our little list over here that she has a stone cube or a block representing her solid foundation. And that is what I'm gonna throw down at the bottom right here. And you know what color is really winter for me is this Viridian. This is like a very dark, cold green. It always makes me think of pine trees and things like that. So it's a perfect color for right now. And I never really use it on its own because it's so transparent. But for now, I think it'll be okay. So I'm gonna load up my brush. You actually can't see because I'm too far off the camera, but you can see it's this color over here. It's kind of like dark green. And let's see how dark I can get it. It's crazy transparent, so. Pretty good actually, it's actually way darker than I thought, nice. Come up here, I'll put the front of the cube coming down this way, and I'm definitely gonna shade this one in. This is kind of a tangent right here. You really actually don't really want that where these lines meet up like this, but when I shade it in, you won't really notice, but just so you know for your own drawing purposes, you actually don't want when things are behind for the lines to meet up perfectly with things that are in the front. It kind of like flattens the whole space. But it's fine, because we're making a flatter picture. It's not a big deal. Uh, when you paint in a cube like this, when you draw in a cube like this, so I'm about to put in this line back here. You actually kind of want it to fold in a little bit. So I actually, if you, if you took a number of whatever angle this is, you actually want this one in the back to be like a little bit less. So that's just what I'm thinking while I'm painting this in right now. Um, and same deal over here. Boom. That's just my opinion. Boom. And we'll come in here. Cool. And yeah, I mean, the other thing I was thinking with all that stuff, like I was talking about the early philosophers and with the Greek stuff and, you know, pre-Christian stuff and things like that. It's kind of interesting because I was thinking about, like, Christianity as it relates to, like, a philosophy of the mind, and like what it has to say about the mind and like what the mind is and things like that. And I was kind of jokingly posting about it on Twitter. I'm always like jokingly posting about whatever I'm like actually thinking about. Um, but I was thinking about logos and like the logos and I just really feel like I could go a little bit deeper like into all that. Like the way the logos is like this ordering principle and I feel like there's just an aspect to the whole thing that I've been sort of like neglecting in my theological studies in a way. Okay, let's kind of paint it in here. That was kind of part of my route into religion in the first place was like what different religions had to say about like what the mind is and 
sort of like the philosophical aspect, I guess you could say. So I'm actually kind of excited to go back through like the Neoplatonic stuff and the Platonism stuff now that I have sort of like a very different perspective on it. Like I was saying before, last time I looked at it was, I mean, it might as well have been like literally like lifetimes ago. Um, I'm thinking about like Plotinus and uh, mostly guys like that, mostly guys like that. It kind of really suits my nature in a way, honestly, because it's kind of like, it's kind of like right where like mysticism meets like obsessive diagrams like about the universe and like hierarchies and like there's angels and humans and like, you know, it really does fit in with like, um, I made that print of the angelic hierarchy based on the writings of Pseudo Dionysus. You can really see there is almost like a spirit of the times in the early, you know, one, two, three, four hundreds where people are like really cracking out honestly on like these hierarchies and these spiritual frameworks and how, you know, there's God and angels and then man and these like different realms and mapping stuff out. It kind of does like really, really suit my nature. Honestly, I love thinking about it. This cube turned out perfectly, by the way. It's kind of like fuzzy, has a little bit of like a different texture than everything else. Okay, before we keep moving on though, let's address how she's dressed. Uh, we're moving at a good speed, but actually we should be going a little bit faster. Um, so I'm just gonna come through. I'm gonna throw down. There's also some weird connections. I'm just gonna, so now we've passed the point where I like talked about all the things I wanna talk about. So I'm just gonna, I got some other, I'm just gonna kinda like riff with you guys, but I feel like there is some cool stuff that I haven't, that I, I, I haven't totally put it together, but I have been thinking about it. Like right now I'm just gonna kinda shade in her shirt. I feel like, you know, let's talk about it. I could put in a pattern on the shirt. Should I? I can't really tell, honestly. I guess stripes is very winter, but it's not really fitting for Faith. Let's think about it for a second. Um, what would Faith be wearing? Faith, clothes, I guess really, could go either way with like nice clothes, like she's like regal and refined, or honestly, Faith has like kind of a humble element to it, doesn't it? I mean, Faith kind of has like a, of the people, no frills, you know, comfortable anywhere kind of feeling to it. It's very like of the people, you know, it's not like a, a faith itself is not like an aristocratic or thing that only refined people possess really. I'm going to lightly put in like a, a kind of like striped shirt, but I'm not going to make it like a, a striped shirt. I'll just kind of hint at like the striped pattern. Mostly I'll just put her in this like blue shirt. The blue shirt is kind of like humble enough, honestly. Let's get a little pigment on there. Someone said keep her in pajamas. She's She's comfy. Uh, Peter said white baptismal robe. Yeah, true actually. Hmm, I don't know if I should keep her in white. I could, I could just bring out the shading and say that she's in white actually. Let's see, maybe we'll do it that way. Cause yeah, I didn't really wanna throw in just flat blue. So maybe just throwing in some shading and making it like she's wearing white. That could actually be kind of dope. Let's see, maybe we'll do it that way. The nice thing about making things white on a white paper is I can always go back in. I could always go back in and put a color in if I decide to make it like that. I feel like she could have like a necklace or something too, honestly. If we don't get a cross in, I'm gonna have her wearing a cross or something. Now that we're getting the shading in, we'll shade in a little bit up here too. Yeah, get the shadow in up there. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, maybe we'll leave it white for a minute. Someone said, uh, wife have this little robe. <laughs> nice. I read, I read Isidore's message. Um, okay, yeah, we'll go with the white robe. Let's do that. And then I gotta start thinking about what's behind her. I'm gonna put in her halo, uh, and that's gonna be a big color decision. I'm kind of feeling, that's where I wanna push the winter thing. Let's do something we haven't done before. We've done like yellow halos and orange halos and all that stuff. Okay, she's wearing white. Let's roll with that for a minute. And let's see, behind her? What's like the winter color for the halo? Could be cerulean blue. That's kind of dope. Is there like a warm winter color though? What's like the warm winter color? Someone said purple for advent. I'm thinking some crazy thoughts right now because Remember, if, if you've been watching the show the whole time, you remember there was like a month where like at the end of every painting, I was like, man, it just needs something. And we added purple in like every time. That was really good. That happened like five times like in a row. Um, 
But I'm kind of thinking, like, what if we took, like, the purple for Advent and dropped that in behind her? That could be kind of cool as the purple halo because it'll kind of, like, warm it up a little bit. Um, let's see. All right, so what we're going to do right now, let's see if we can mix up a good purple because... Oh, I actually have. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. So I have this. This is called Brilliant Red Violet. This is going to be, like... The problem with this color is that it's going to mess up the whole color palette. You can see... Actually, I can't even get it open, so it's not going to happen. But you can see the color here anyway. It's going to mess up the whole color palette because we have like a dark pigment thing going on right now. And this is going to just, it's going to just like blow it out. It's like if you have like a few like string instruments together and you just bring in some totally random like other instrument that doesn't fit. That's kind of what's going to happen, I feel like, if I bring that out. The thing is, though, I actually don't even know if I've ever used this color on the show. This is dioxazine violet. Um, this is the coldest color that I have. So the palette runs a spectrum in terms of warmth, the warmest being vermilion. Really, I have cadmium scarlet, but I call it vermilion because that's what I'm used to using. Cadmium scarlet is the warmest color, and this is the coolest color. So let's, this might actually be interesting. Let's see. RKD said, yo, by the way, RKD asked me to send him a scan of the painting from last week, and I didn't do it yet, but I am going to. Um, I was partially kidding, but if you put a little open collar with some buttons, it would look like old-timey sleepwear. <laughs> yeah, like pajama style. That is interesting. Esoteric. What is what? Are, what do symbol? What do pajamas represent in terms of spiritual symbolism? Well, you wear pajamas when you're at home, comfortable, comfort. The body finally at rest is now suited to contemplate things of a higher nature. Okay, let's see. So this is kind of dioxazine violet, Ugh, no, right? No, that's not what we want. I mean, it's actually, it's almost kind of, it's almost kind of dope, but it's like a little like Crayola marker, right? You guys feel what I'm saying right now? It's not exactly what we want. It has a little bit of that Crayola marker feeling. That's not what we want. We have like such a deep, I mean, the dark is, oh, man, I'm really torn right now. I do it live. You can feel the torn element in my voice. Um, with with the dark, with the dark, it actually looks kind of hot. It actually looks kind of dope with the dark. Um, let's do it. I think we should do it. I think we should do it with the dark purple fading into the light. And then we'll be able to get away with it because if we don't like how the light purple looks, I can fade in like a, a blue and it, it'll be fine. But there's something about this, something about the purple and white combo that's very winter for me, honestly. Just the dark purple with the white. This has always been like a super... Uh, a super like uh, wintry like color scheme for me. Just the purple and white. It's kind of rare that just like two colors together will have such a character, but there you go. Okay. So I'm just gonna throw it in kind of tight though, cause I don't want it to like alter the whole timbre, the whole timbre of the painting using musical, musical analogies. Someone said your analogy doesn't work because of Stravinsky's ballet, Agon. I actually don't know that one. I actually don't know that one. I was into Stravinsky for a minute, actually. Okay, so I'm just gonna come around here. I would kind of like it to fade into the lighter as it gets towards the candle. So I'm gonna cheat and just get the pigment off the brush. Didn't exactly do what I wanted it to, but it's okay. Cool. And lately I've been using the dark halos. It actually kind of fits in a way because it's like she's set against the dark background you know so even if you read it like oh it's like a dark halo like oh it's like you know darkness like it's like the faith is like set against the darkness you know i made this image of like a friar the other day and i, I gave him a dark halo and it was like he's in like i was thinking of it as like oh he's in this like dark world you know and he he's like set against it so whenever i'm making any image i honestly like maybe some people think because i'm on the stream that's like why i like give everything like a meaning or whatever but honestly even when i'm just working in the studio like literally every little detail i think about it to like a probably like slightly psychotic extent honestly oh dude look at the fade up oh, yes so tight okay let's just bring it up a little bit nice oh, it's perfect it's perfect I also talk like this when you guys aren't here. When it's just me, I'll still be like, yes, it's perfect. Okay. And how much can we get the fade up? Can we get it can we get it totally faded over? Let's see. Perfect. And yeah, I'm working on a liturgical calendar right now. 
I don't think I broke it out on the stream. I posted it on Patreon, but I don't think I brought it out here. But so that involved me kind of looking at like what colors are for the different years and stuff. Different years, different parts of the year, stuff like that. Okay, nice. Oh man, man, the dark halo is such a good call. Such a good call. Okay, let's get this up here. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's a little bit of an extreme. I should have just left it there. I should have left that. Left that. See, that's a perfect example. If you were really closely watching, I should have just left that natural, nice fade that I had. But instead, I poked into it and then I ruined it. It's not going to matter at all for the overall quality of the picture, but it'll settle. Actually, it's kind of settling now. Back to where, back to how it was. That's a perfect example of what I'm always talking about with the watercolors. You really can't force them to do things. You kind of just have to lean into what they're doing. So if you watch that little moment, that was a perfect example of that. Man, that's dope. That is really tight. Awesome. It's like that meme, like me looking at my own Instagram page. Wow, this is so good. Like me looking at my own painting, like, yeah. But actually, it looks, it looks good. It looks really good. Could just leave it like this, but obviously we're not going to. Uh, someone said the winter skies when, when it's snowing at night is kind of purple near me or reddish. Yeah, that's cool, actually. Okay. Okay. Let's make some big calls. Uh, we got to make some big calls right now. I got to start making some big moves. Um, I do want to give her some kind of necklace or something, but that can happen later. It'll happen later. Um, for now, you know, actually, you know, it'll be tight. Actually, maybe it won't happen later. Maybe I'll do it right now. Um, it would be cool. I think what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do it right now since I'm thinking about it. I'm going to take the blue that we used for her lines and just really lightly, I'm going to put in a little bit of like a string. She's wearing a little necklace. It's very light. It's actually too light. But I don't want it to be too hard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give her a stone at the end instead of a cross. Obviously, I like putting crosses on things, but sometimes I like to, you know, mix it up a little bit. We'll get a we'll get a cross in here somewhere. Sometimes sometimes it's got to be a little more subtle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that light purple color and I'm actually going to make the stone that she's wearing that light purple color because this is like the exact color of amethyst. And if you don't know, a nice fact about amethyst is that it actually gets its name, the A in the beginning of amethyst. Oh, way too light. I erased it. The A in the beginning of the word amethyst is like A in English. It's like apolitical or atypical it means without so I'm going to paint it super dark and then pick up the color and then methist comes from a word that means intoxicated and actually they used to think a really long time ago that like a magical Greek stones time that if you wore amethyst it would like protect you against becoming intoxicated and that's why it has its name so it's like she's wearing this stone that represents like lack of intoxication it's actually kind of fitting for faith not, not not necessarily mundane intoxication. Obviously, that's not just what I'm talking about. You know, intoxication itself is like symbolic of, of, of larger things. Perfect. Perfect. And we, and we brought the purple into her figure. It's good. It's a good move. Um, okay. So let's see. Now we got to make some powerful calls. Uh, a, what is she sitting on? I feel like her sitting on a stone is kind of dope. I might make her sitting on a stone. Uh, and then we'll get like a body halo behind her and then we'll think about the left and right because we got all, that means we, we kind of have a lot to do, but it's all good. Um, I'm going to pick up. So for the gray of the stone, we're going to have her sitting on a stone, obviously, like I said. Uh, I'm going to do that thing that we talk about sometimes where I'm going to mix a gray using two opposite colors. So actually off screen, I'm just grabbing some of the orange. You can see it already kind of has started to cancel itself out. In case you haven't heard me say it a hundred times, colors that are opposite on the color wheel cancel each other out. So I'm taking this orange and I'm gonna mix it with the blue and that's how we're gonna get our cool gray for the stone that she's sitting on. And I also need white. Cool. Someone said, is she wearing a baseball helmet? No. Banned from the chat, no, I'm just playing. Uh, no, it's one of those, uh, I didn't put the etchings in. It's one of those like renaissance -y helmets. Have you seen them where they, they taper like this? This is, this is what they look like. So you're not, you're not offending me, but they do look kind of like baseball helmets, I guess. Sometimes they have a big like feather coming out of the back. That, that would make it more, look more like a medieval helmet. Actually, that would be kind of dope. Maybe we'll do that. Okay. I'm going to grab a little bit of this white. 
So you can see I'm mixing this gray over here and you're probably like, that's not gray. Uh, it's way too orange actually. I really thought the blue would pull more of its weight over here, but it really didn't. So I'm just gonna drop in the blue. There we go. I don't want it to be totally gray, but I want it to fit in with the situation we have going on. It's pretty good, let's see. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, the feather would be sick and we could make it like a peacock feather. That would be pretty awesome. Actually, we're definitely gonna do that, just so you guys know. Hmm, it's a good stone color. It's pretty good, actually. I just wanna make sure it's nice and mixed up so the orange and blue doesn't like come through. Let's do it. I'm gonna throw in the stone color and then we'll use the blue that we used for her lines and hair as the shadow if we want to do that. So we're sitting on a stone, a rock, good, good Christian symbolism on a rock, sturdy foundation, Petrine. So we'll get it going here. Yeah, perfect. But this looks too much like a cloud now, perfect. So while we're sitting on a rock, it's snow winter style, so maybe we'll have her uh, sitting in the snow or something. She's gonna be up on this rock. So I'm gonna come in and I wanna get some of that watercolory kind of bleed out. So I'm actually just gonna throw down a bunch of the pigment since it's a rock and then I'm gonna come in with the water and just see what I can do in terms of teasing it out. It might not, it might not go opaque at all, but it might a little bit. Let's see. So in case you can't, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, off screen I'm just uh, loading up the brush with water. Didn't really do anything though. The pigment's like too much, it's like too thick. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to shade it in. And then I'm gonna come back in with the paper towel and draw some splotches out. And that'll maybe make it look a little bit more rock-like. So I'm just gonna grab a tear of this. I'm just gonna come in and kind of just press in a little bit. Yeah, there we go, it's perfect. Same deal over here. Same deal over here. Although actually the light should be more over this way. It's too much though, can't get in there. Pretty good. Really just the first push was perfect. I didn't need to do anything else after that, honestly. White peacock is a symbol for Christ. Yeah, that's dope. We can throw in the white peacock feather. Although if we throw in the white peacock feather, that means we have to have something that the peacock feather is like set off against. Let's see. It being a baseball helmet would fit your vibe of being urban mystic. Yeah, it's true actually. Or rule style. Um, okay, and I'm gonna bring in a little bit of the shadow over here. By the way, if you say something in the chat to me and I don't see it, you can just put it again or something. Um, I just don't want people to ever think that I'm like, like I see a message to me and I'm like, <laughs> not reading that one. <laughs> not, not touching that one. Unless it's something that actually I can't say on the camera. In which case, that's actually exactly what would happen. Uh, RKD said, in classical art, did they have halos as something that is influenced by light? Do they have halos as something that is influenced by light? Whenever I've seen them, they always seem separate from the reality of the painting. Yeah, dude, 100%, they definitely do. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. if you look at like Rembrandt era or when things start to get like more realistic, honestly, um, they do have that. Yeah, the halos will be actually glowing and actually what's more common, since you asked, kind of a cool question actually, I'm just gonna pull this out really quick. What you'll actually see sometimes that's more common is, uh, is you'll get like the person so let's say you have like the angel or something. Very sophisticated. I've been practicing doing art my entire life. So you get the angel or something, it's kind of fat. And instead of getting the flat circle halo, what you'll get is a super thin ribbon halo. So it'll be like this, but it's not filled in. It's almost like someone took gold thread and just put it in 3D and then you'll get like shadows and like shine in here. Uh, that might be in some Rembrandt paintings, but it's at least like Rembrandt era. Once things get more realistic, people start to do that. So yeah, they do, they do. Um, okay, man, that stone looks great. It's like exactly what I wanted, perfect. Okay, we got the stone. Uh, I kind of want to put like a glow around her also, but the balance of color is so good right now. It's such a good balance of color. I feel like, you know, the only color I could really get in here is gonna be cerulean. Let's see if I can throw in like a light cerulean background behind her. This is like a really cool blue-green. It's almost a warm blue, actually. 
let's see. So normally I would put in honestly kind of like a cobalt blue, but the cobalt blue is like Virgin Mary blue. That's like that bold, 100% completely blue that you see sometimes. But I think this kind of like blue green might be more the way to go. And I might throw in some white. You can see I have to dig it out of here because for some reason the pigment and binder they use in here, they like react with each other or something like in transit and all the tubes I can find of these are like hard and like already dry. Anyway though. Boom. Okay. Um, grabbing white. We gotta move, if we, especially if we wanna get the uh, guy worshiping a monkey, right? We gotta squeeze that in. So we're moving quickly now. Perfect. So I'm just gonna grab some white. I'm gonna throw it in here. Yeah, perfect. This will be a very like wintry color. Got a little bit too much paint on my brush. Coming up on like the gold part. Cool. Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to talk about before we just straight up segue into like random topics? Not really, I basically gave you a pretty good portrait of where my head is at, honestly. Portrait, no pun intended. Um, but I am thinking about the kind of like philosophy stuff and things like that. I mean, like I said, I never have time to read, so who knows how it'll actually materialize. You know, we've talked about like Christ the Eternal Tao, if anyone knows that book. It's a really weird book. It's all about this idea this this guy has about how like the Tao Te Ching and the idea of the Tao and like Chinese philosophy is like a premonition of like the nature of God. Um, it's a guy that was like the student of Sarah from Rose. But it's kind of crazy, honestly, because even just stripped of like, you know, any like academic knowledge or anything, like I feel like the logos in Greek philosophy is literally the Tao in Taoism, right? I mean, if, I, I, I don't know if that makes sense to the people that don't know about it, but if you do know about it, I mean, they're literally the same thing. It's like this subtle principle that organizes the apparent, like, I mean, you know, like, I don't want to say chaos of life, but it's like this subtle organizing principle that like pervades everything with some level of like reason and order, I guess, if I had to give like a one second explanation. But honestly, this week, I was just tripping out thinking about how they're literally the same thing. Um, I kind of like, I knew, I knew, I knew that already, but you know, you know something in your brain and then it kind of like percolates like a different level. And I was like, yeah, they are literally the same exact thing, dude. Like what? Um, also the other cool connection I made, and I guess we'll stop talking about this, but I tweeted, I made a joke about Heraclitus on my Twitter. And in case you don't know about him, basically his philosophy is all about like, how things are always changing and, you know, nothing stays the same and everything, you know, disappears and goes away and everything crumbles because everything's in this constant state of flux and change, basically. I thought it was interesting because, dude, this looks great so far, but we really need to hustle. I thought it was really interesting because uh, I was thinking, you know, in my own amateur studies, I was like, okay, well, that's really interesting. You know, if I had to relate that to something in Christianity, what would I relate it to? And I was like, well, I guess I would relate it to... Uh, Oh man, I ruined my metaphor because it's not Ephesians. I was going to say it's the book of Ephesians and then Heraclitus is from Ephesus. But actually I wasn't thinking of Ephesians. I was thinking of Ecclesiastes. Oh man, I thought I made a cool connection, but I didn't. I was thinking anyway, the, the idea of that. I was like, if I had to relate to something Christian, it made me think of Ecclesiastes. Is Ecclesiastes or Ecclesiastes? Anyway, I was thinking about that because it's all, you know, nothing new under the sun. Things die, things go away, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, I thought I had a really dope connection there, but actually I don't, so we're just going to move on. Okay, um, so we got to decide what we're going to do for the background right now. Uh, in the description that we read, it talked about two things in the background. A man worshipping a monkey, which was a symbol of idolatry in the Middle Ages, and it also talked about a man chained to an idol. We got a few options here right now. If we're going to start thinking about how we're going to, you know, close, not close this out, but start, you know, making moves towards, towards the end of this, i.e. start, you know, wrap, not wrapping it up, but you know what I'm saying? Um, I feel like what we should do is man worshiping a monkey. That's just so tight. I mean, it's so on brand with the whole situation we have going on here. Right. Obviously. Uh, so I feel like what we should do is let's put that, if this is the foreground, if this is the front ground, over here, 
let's put that in like the middle ground over here. So I'll kind of just put it in in like dark colors and we'll have this guy, I'll kind of like be in darkness and we'll put him under like a dead tree actually. That's perfect, very, very suiting for winter. And then what I think we'll do is on the other side, we'll, we'll so we'll have like the horizon or something in the back pretty high up. And then we'll just kind of put in a guy that has a little line from his neck leading to a statue, just like little like, like quickly put in very simply. So that's how we'll kind of, we'll kind of do that I think. Um, a bunch of Jesuits in China thought the I Ching prophetically preceded Christ. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. The Jesuits are really, really into like, um, what's the technical term for it? They don't call it like adaptability. They call it like, uh, I forget, but they're, they're really into like catering the folk teachings of a place. I don't want to say folk teachings, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not like trying to belittle it. The teachings of a place into Christianity. Uh, some people say they do it too much, but I don't really, I haven't gone that hard enough to have an opinion on it. I've also gotten interested in Neoplatonism and how it relates to Christianity. Are there any recommended Neoplatonic texts to understanding Christian mysticism? Um, yeah, actually, I have something that I would recommend. Uh, I'll plug it in a second while I'm painting because I, I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, but I do recommend a book. Uh, here I have a pen. It's called Christian Mysticism by W.R. Ing. His name's I-N-G-E. And there's, a, there's two chapters on uh, how Christianity relates to Neoplatonism. Um... Anyway, so let's get this going. Monkey on a pillar. You know, I don't want to get... So now that we have the dope color scheme established, I don't want to start like messing it up too much. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to use colors that we've already already dropped in. So I'm just going to throw in the monkey with this burnt umber color. You could get like crazy about it. Like it kind of fits if like there's this idol and it's like the inverse of like the baptistry in a way. But honestly, it's a monkey, so it's brown. That's also really the reason. And I'm just gonna paint this in kind of loose. And while I'm painting in this monkey, I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, there are books about it. Um, there are some books I wanna pick up, but like I said, I'm like struggling to, uh, not struggling. Yeah. What, what's, a, what's a step above struggling? You know, I'm, I'm working to make the art studio a thing, so I, I don't really have time to read ever unless my wife is like really gung-ho about reading before bed. Oh, the ears are too small, you can't even see. I gotta make this a little bigger. Um, so there are some books. I do want to pick them up, but who knows if I'll actually get to reading them. But uh, something I do really like, a book that I really feel like I got a lot out of and that I go back to sometimes, like I said, it's called Christian Mysticism by W.R. That's his first name, W.R., his initials, obviously. And his last name's I-N-G-E. I-N-G, I guess. And I've plugged it a bunch of times here. It's a series of lectures this guy gave at Oxford. And he's really biased about his own opinions. Like he says, like some people are stupid in the book and like, you know, he, he's English and Protestant. So he's really biased against Catholicism, but you know, everyone's biased in their own way. But I really like the book just because it's like a survey of Christian mysticism. And it's a really good way to jump off of things. Um, I just really like the way he lays it out in there, honestly. And there's two, two chapters in there on Neoplatonism as it relates to Christian mysticism. Uh, One's called in the East and one's called in the West. Um, and I think it's a really good uh, starting point. Whenever I recommend stuff, I always have to say, like, you know, it's not like it's like the gospel to me. You know, I always wear I'm going to recommend something and someone's going to come back and be like, oh, my God, on page 42, this guy says this. Owen endorsed this and said that this is the best book ever. So I'm not saying that. but And it's old enough to be in public domain. So actually, you could Google it up and start reading it right now. So I'm pushing the, the watercolor texture here, but I think it's okay. I think it'll be good. Other than that, I'm sure there's a ton of stuff, but I couldn't say offhand. Um, for a lot of that stuff, though, honestly, I mean, the thing is that you, you know, you can hear what a lot of people say, and then you kind of have to make your own, like, connections, honestly, and draw your own opinions. You know, you could read, you could read one book that'll say, I mean, you know this, obviously, because you're here, but just saying. You know, you could read one book that would say, well, this, this church father was literally a hardcore Platonist. And this guy who is a doctor of the church literally was just a follower of Plato and loved Plato. And he's a Platonist, basically. And then you can read another book that says, nah, people say that, but they're wrong. It's dumb. Um, so, you know, you kind of got to read a lot of stuff and like decide what you think about things. Man, I'm really feeling this texture I got on this monkey over here. Uh, I'm going to throw in the stone pillar beneath him also. Um... But yeah, I, I used to joke, like, I feel like my spiritual life just alternates between, like, Europe. At some point, I couldn't really pin down that side of things, you know. Probably between, like, the Reformation, Europe, 1000 AD Europe, and then, like, Alexandria in, like, 250 BC AD. 
And I feel like that's just like the ride I go around. I just go around the ride of like, here we are in like Germany during the ref Germany and France during the Reformation. Uh, maybe, maybe here we are in America, and then here we are in like Alexandria in uh, 250 AD. And I just go around and around and around and around and around, and that's my life basically. Not that I'm complaining. Definitely not complaining. Could be a lot worse. Okay. But I really feel like I would fit in there, honestly. <laughs> not because I'm like, not that I think I'm smart. I just like the vibe of like people in Alexandria just like arguing about like, you know, all these different systems and being like an early Christian. I mean, that really like appeals to me a lot. Uh, okay. Dude, loving this texture. The feet bleeding in. Oh, loving it. Um, if you want my critique, this, this brown is a little warm, actually. I would have liked this to be a cooler brown, but yeah, I'm not going to cry about it. Um, and now I want to put in someone worshiping him. I don't want to start getting a full, uh, a whole like really detailed guy in here because I'm trying to like plow, not plow, but get towards the end. So I think I might actually just put in like a very, very simplified guy from the back. He's going to be pretty small actually. So this is, that means this is a huge monkey sculpture, but whatever. It's kind of cool, honestly. Um, so we're going to take the blue over here. It's not too blue, but I'm going to make it. Let's so opaque anyway. Enculturation, yeah, it might be called enculturation, the Jesuit thing that I was talking about. I think that's what it's called. Someone said, what do you think of the mostly online group of Orthodox who deny Neoplatonism has any influence on Christianity? Parentheses, Dyer. Uh, that's interesting. Does Jay, does, does Jay Dyer say that? That's really interesting. Um, I mean, if you're saying telling me specifically that Jay Dyer says that, uh, I actually would be really interested to hear him talk about that send me something um it's interesting i mean the thing is that i kind of uh i kind of really like have come to terms with my like station in uh in this whole thing and that i really am like a painter you know so i don't really i'm also like a more mystically inclined person you could say that's a cop-out i'm cool with it but I don't really feel the need to come out so hard, like, swinging about things like that. If someone told me that they had a stone-cold case in view that Neoplatonism had no influence <clears throat> on uh, <clears throat> early Christianity or Christianity in general, I'm open to it. I'll hear it out for sure. <clears throat> I think also the thing is that with stuff like that, it's... I, in general, so I'm not talking about that specific case now because I couldn't really specifically say, but I feel like in general, it's kind of hard sometimes to come out so hard and be like, yo, this thing had zero influence on this other thing when it's such a complex situation. But I don't know if he thinks that I'm open to it. <clears throat> I think that also, I guess what I'm kind of dancing around also is that I feel like just for my own, uh, so I made this guy kind of like on his knees down here at this sculpture. They kind of like bleed his feet out a little bit. So you get like a little bit of a shadow. I feel like also, uh, I guess kind of what I'm dancing around is like, I feel like even something like Neoplatonism, don't you feel like if you ask like 12 different people for their definition of Neoplatonism, you would get like 12 different answers? You know what I mean? I'm not saying that means it has no definition, but uh, I feel like that's also interesting. Like when I was in like, you know, Western occult world and stuff, like, you know, sometimes people use Neoplatonism just to mean, like, any kind of idea or philosophy where there's, like, a hierarchy of, like, stuff kind of trickling down below. Um, but, yeah, I couldn't really say. I couldn't really say. Uh, okay. So, I do want to... Actually, I do want to keep talking about that, but I just want to make sure I keep <clears throat> this moving to, like, a reasonable extent. Okay. Um, monkey Idol. Horizon. Throwing down the Horizon. Throw it on the horizon in a dead tree right now while I'm talking. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I guess I guess my kind of like answer to that question is like, for me, it's kind of like, you know, there's like, I hate when other people do what I'm about to do right now. So, so whatever, I'm going to do it anyway. I feel like there are kind of like levels and there's different, uh, levels isn't really the word. I want to rephrase what I'm saying carefully right now. I feel like there's there's so many different frameworks that I'm kind of getting to this point where like, 
once you go deep enough into different like theological perspectives, it's not like I think that no one's right or wrong, but I'm getting to this point where it's a lot easier for me to see people's different points of view as valid. And I guess that's kind of probably part of me being like an artist and like a mystically inclined person rather than a philosopher. Cause like, honestly, I mean, you probably know if you have like hung around, like I really don't think of myself like as a philosopher, like I wouldn't be equipped to like have like a philosophical debate with someone. Honestly, for me, it really is more about like aesthetics and like the vibe and stuff. So I'm going to move this light so you can see the dark tree over here. So I feel like that's kind of also just like an interesting aspect of my spiritual development that I don't really exactly know what that means. It kind of puts me at odds a little bit with a lot of uh, the online stuff. I don't want it to make, I don't want it to sound right now like I'm like crypto talking shit about Jay Dyer just because you mentioned him specifically. I actually do like his videos and I actually have watched them quite a bit um, and I've gotten a lot from them. So I, I just want to explicitly say that I, I'm not I'm not thinking about him while I'm while I'm having this little narrative right now because um, sometimes people you know will be like oh that guy well you know sometimes people so I'm I'm not talking about him at all right now um, but for me in general you know. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've talked about it before on the show, but it's kind of like, I'm putting a dead tree over here too. It's kind of like what's happened is I've gone further and further into like different like theological issues and theological debates and stuff. It kind of is like sometimes, it's not always the case. Sometimes I'll hear two people explicate an issue and I'll be like, wow, this guy over here is totally right. Definitely. So I don't want to make it sound like it's 100% like wishy-washy. But sometimes more and more, I'm kind of at this point where like, yeah, I can kind of feel like where different people are coming from and... I don't know. It's interesting. And I was going to say, I, I clarified I wasn't thinking about him, but it kind of puts me at odds with like some of the online Christian vibe, just because I feel like a lot of people like, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. Actually, I kind of enjoy it, to be honest with you. Um, but like their whole vibe is like putting forth their view and like debating and stuff. And like I said, I'm not crypto talking shit. I actually enjoy it a lot. Um, but it's not really, it's not really my particular vibe. It's not really my particular vibe. Just because I'm not that confident about particular minutia. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I am. I'm giving a very cagey answer right now. It sounds like I'm hiding something, but I'm really not actually. <laughs> okay. So let's just focus in. It's 842. Let's see. Uh, okay. So someone said, uh, same person comes from this book, Kolosky's Mystical Theology. They won't admit that Pseudo Dionysus was contemporary with Proclus and other Neoplatonists. Yeah, I mean, he's contemporary with them. I don't know, it'd be interesting though. Like I said, I'm, I'm really not a philosopher, nor do I pretend to be. It'd be interesting though to see, like if you took someone like Pseudo Dionysus and like tried to like pin it down and be like, you know, 100% there is Neoplatonic influence here or 100% there's not. I actually don't really know what that would look like. Like, you know what, he has like a hierarchy with like beings sort of moving between these like different hierarchies. I mean, it's kind of like Neoplatonic, right? But at the same time, I mean, they don't really have like a corner on that. It's not like just by virtue of having these like interlocking hierarchies that you're like inherently doing like Neoplatonism. Anyway, though, um, okay. Let's see what we want to do right here. So it's 842. Um, I just want to see exactly where we want to start going here. And then I'll see if there's anything else. You know, uh, I see people asking me stuff in the chat. I'll poke into it, but I just want to hone in here. Because let's see, we got some decisions to make right now. I actually really like how this looks. This is a little too light over here. I tried to darken it up like a few times, but it didn't really take. I don't want to make it too dark. I kind of like that he's like ghosty over here. This is again the watercolor thing. Maybe I just need to like accept it and just accept that it's like a little light over here. I don't want to make it like too dark and like ruin it like I just did. <laughs> boom, boom. Okay. But let's see. Um... We got a lot of space over here. I really didn't anticipate having this much space. And we can get away with it with the snow, but we kind of have to have something over here to balance out the situation going on over here. Okay. I think what we're going to do, actually, so this is perfectly fitting with faith, actually, and actually kind of everything we talked about. Um, I also love how the water's spilling out of here, by the way. It looks really dope. I'm going to make a rose growing out of the snow here. That's dope. And there'll be like some light coming off of it. There'll be like a light. This is perfect. This is, this is, how we're, this is where we're going to go, the arc of the rest of it. So we're going to have the rose with the light and then some light on the snow. And then the rest of it will just be snow. I'll put in probably night sky. Maybe not too night, maybe a little bit of night, but that's, that's the arc that we're going down. Um, 
So I'm gonna throw in this rose. Can I can I get through one picture without using a rose or a book? No, it's literally impossible. Literally impossible. Okay. You said you've been reading up on papal history. Where are you currently leaning on the ortho Catholic debate over the role of the Pope? Yeah, I mean, it kind of just fits into what I was just talking about, man, honestly. Um, that particular thing is something that I, I feel like I pick up and put down. I And the period, the periods of time, <laughs> the periods of time over which I pick it up and put it down get longer and sh longer and longer. So I feel like I just put it down for like a minute just because, I don't want to say I hit a wall, but I feel like I kind of did. Um, but I don't really know, man. I mean, I really feel like, honestly, if you ask me that question, I feel like it would vary every few days when, when I'm when I'm thinking about it the most. When I'm thinking about it the most, every three days, you could get a different answer from me, honestly, if I'm being totally, completely honest with you. Um, and I know it's been kind of like a roller coaster ride for my wife, which I appreciate her coming along with me on. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, man. I can really see it both ways, honestly. I feel like whichever church I end up joining, I'll probably... Uh, it might end up being more of a result of like, like, damn, I keep moving the painting. I keep moving the painting. Of uh, just how things like shake out for me. I don't really know, man. I don't really know what I'm going to do about that. But like I said, I kind of just put it down. Not that I, not that I don't want you asking me about it. I'm kind of trying to get like a little bit of light on this rose over here. One thing that is affecting it for me, honestly, I feel like it's been a few weeks since we talked about it. I try and not make it like the whole topic of the show, but we haven't talked about it for a few weeks, I guess. Um, one thing I feel like it, it's, it doesn't really make it lean either way, but one thing that's interesting about me thinking about my own spiritual path and like how it's going to like materialize and stuff. Oh, I'm going to use Viridian for the stem, obviously same color as the cube, which again, actually fits that the cube represents the earth. And then the stem connecting the rose to the earth is the same color. So it kind of, kind of always plays out that way, uh, is that I'm going to have kids eventually, man. And, uh, like eventually, like, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm like, I'm one step beyond it being abstract. Uh, you know, like everyone, most people on Twitter, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna have kids eventually, you know, but I'm kind of like one step beyond it being like, yeah, it's probably gonna happen eventually. I'm like, yeah, it's gonna happen. It's definitely gonna happen. It's at some point, maybe not soon, not soon, but it's gonna happen, soon, you know, maybe soon. Is it soon? Like, I'm kind of at that point with it. Maybe soon, I don't know. But the point is that that's definitely affected it because obviously, you know, I have to like raise my kid like spiritually and stuff too, um, as well as physically. You could even say it's more important to do it spiritually. Got to do both, I guess. But so that's been kind of interesting, man. Like I watched this show with my wife recently. Um, sometimes, you know, I veg out with the with the woman. I will occasionally partake of uh, television. Very rarely, though. She actually watches pretty intelligent stuff. But anyway, we watched this show, and uh, it was about these kids in college. And we checked it out because it was this show on Netflix. Don't watch it. It's actually pretty abysmal. It's all about these deaf kids in college. So I was like, eh, a documentary about weird people. Like, whatever, I'm down. Not that being deaf is weird, but you know what I'm saying. And I was just so caught off guard because the whole thing was like these girls just like having sex with these guys and like getting abortions and everyone leading these like horrible, like frankly, like twisted, you know, like and having no spiritual direction and just like, you know, I mean, it's okay. Like people make mistakes and do whatever. Like I'm not like, you know, I, I get it. But at the same time, it was just like, so like, I'm looking at like the underworld, like, damn, like, this is just dark. The way these people are like, not even really what's hand, what, what's happening to them, but like how they're handling it, you know? And the whole time we were watching it, I was like, wow, I'm going to have kids and I have to like raise them. <laughs> That's like, honestly what I was thinking about the entire time. Cause I was like, wow, at some point, I tried to put in the pedals way too early. So I'm going to try and lean in and just make them these big flowing, like watery pedals. And I was like, the whole time I was watching it, I was like, man, I'm going to have kids. And like, eventually I'm going to like send them to college and like, they're going to be in this world. I mean, maybe they won't go to college. Who knows how the next like X number of years are going to play out. But you know what I'm getting at? Like, eventually they're going to be like in the world, like in some capacity. And that's like what I was thinking about the entire time while I was watching it. And uh, it doesn't directly relate to like me, like choosing a church or something, but it's just interesting because it's not like the whole time I've been thinking just about me, but then now I'm like becoming this like, eventually I'll be like the leader of like a family, I guess, you know, and that's also interesting. It makes everything like way more real. I was listening to some, some guy on some show and they were asking him like, Oh, you know, why'd you, uh, why'd you join like X church or whatever? You know, and he was like, honestly, I got married. He was like, it got too real. I had to just, <laughs> I had to join a church, honestly. 
And everyone was like, yeah, true. <laughs> this is kind of funny. Um, anyway. Compot just dropped a 17-hour podcast. You got to amp it up. Four-hour painting stream. Let's go. Wow. Is it, did he really? Did he really? I, I don't know if you're exaggerating or not. I know he dropped an eight-hour podcast. Um, I should do like an epically long painting stream. I will one day. I will one day. Okay, so I'm, same deal. I'm going to try and just, and I know I'm, it looks kind of messy, but I'm kind of just trying to push it with the colors over here. Because I said I would push it more, and we really didn't. So I'm just going to get some of this like, light coming off. And I know I got the red like bleeding out of the rose, but I thought it would be cool. I thought it would be cool to kind of just get that color like bleeding out. Maybe I'll pick it up a little bit. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. I actually like that. I actually like that. And we'll take some of the yellow. Is it actually a 17 long podcast though? I actually want, I actually, I kind of, I kind of want to know. Um, a lot of her is straight up plagiarized, borrowed from uh, Proclus. Yeah, the Neoplatonism stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I really want to go harder to, to dig into that. The thing is though, yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. I really don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I can hardcore, you know, make these like hardcore assertions about stuff, but we'll see. In that way, I really, that's really why I identify with like the mystical tradition. It's so, it's like epically cringe to like call yourself a mystic because that, which I would never do, because that implies certain things about your own like spiritual progress. But in general, like that's, I would phrase it the way I did. I like identify with like mysticism and uh, my forays into like theology and things like that are ultimately uh, from that perspective. I'm not doing it from the perspective of like winning a debate as much as I would, as much as I, as much as I enjoy a six hour debate. You know I do. So let's see, I'm gonna try and throw in some big patches of this light blue to try and get like a little bit of like the snowy texture in here. I should get a bigger brush, but I'm not going to. So if you wanna wanna write to the uh, admin of the show about it, you can do so, which is me. So come in here, it's just kind of like just patches of blue. Let's get some patches in here. Uh, someone said you gotta put in the elephant. <laughs> oh yo, I forgot about the elephant actually. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will put in the elephant. That's actually a pretty pretty great call. Oh, I'll throw in some of this blue patches. Just a little bit. It's just enough to imply that it's not like white space, honestly. I'm, it's either, what's coming out of my brush is either too dark or you can't see it. I'm, I can't get that fitting the philosophy theme. I can't get that Aristotelian mean. I can't get that perfect level of light and dark. All right, just a little bit. Yeah, this is actually coming out pretty tight. Okay, we'll throw in the elephant. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty fitting. Let's do it. I'll throw it in right over here. I'll put it in with the gray. I'll put it in the gray. I don't think I, I haven't painted an elephant. Honestly, I haven't painted an elephant probably in like 10 years. Actually, because I used to, no, nah, it's been less than 10 years. I used to use elephants in Buddhism sometimes, but, but I haven't done it in a long time. Uh, you gotta put in the elephant, not paint a rose challenge, impossible, true. It actually is a 17.5 hour long podcast. That's insane. That's insane. So if Kampa dropped a 17 point, I'm not, not saying it's bad, but if Kampa dropped a 17.5 hour podcast, that means that you could hang out, take acid, s listen to the entire podcast and still have m like five hours after totally, completely sobering up. That's insane. Um, okay. Ring in the new year with an epic painting stream. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea. That's actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, we should do some like kind of like marathon session or something. Um, okay. So I'm going to put it in. I'm just going to have to lean in to the flat 400 AD, 1000 AD painting style that we did before. So I'm going to put it in kind of like a medieval artist would. And what that means is we got the trunk. Coming down over here. And then we got the head. And then I'm just gonna put in the big ear. And then usually the, the artists like they know where, they know what the animal has, but they don't know exactly how it fits together. So we need the tusk also. So the tusk kind of comes out over here. It's actually pretty good. It's a pretty good elephant head. I'm gonna move the light so there's no glow. There we go, perfect. Yeah, it would be cool to do some kind of like marathon session. At some point, there's also gonna be a little bit of a momentary like, I don't wanna call it a spin-off, a little bit of like a spin-off from the painting show. 
I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be doing the show, obviously, but I'm doing like another project that kind of fits in with the painting show, but not exactly where I'm going to prep these like muslin canvases and do these like pretty hardcore, like medieval style paintings. Um, so it should be pretty cool. I've had the materials here. I think I showed them on one episode, but I have like the muslin and the supports and the string and like everything I need. I'm like kind of amped to do it actually. Okay. So I'm just going to shade this in. It might be a little bit darker than I wanted. Okay. What's the review on my elephant? Someone said it looks like a turkey. Honestly, I'll take poor reviews of the elephant, but I, I don't think it looks like a turkey, personally. But you're entitled to your opinion. We're in the subjective realm here. As a mysticism-oriented painting show, we are in the subjective realms, and if you feel like it looks like a turkey, I can't, can't full-on tell you it doesn't, but I don't think it does. Okay, cool. That's good, actually. That's perfect. We didn't put in the feather. Maybe we, maybe I will. We started a little bit later than normal because I had so much I wanted to talk about in the beginning. I'm gonna throw this in right here. Nice. It actually, it actually looks pretty good. And I'm gonna throw in the eye, and the paint's still gonna be wet, so it's a little early, but I'm just gonna do it anyway. Uh, yeah, no, that's not gonna be the eye. That's, that's just gonna be a random dark patch, so I'm just gonna tease that out. Put an eye right there when it dries. Okay. Perfect. Got to start a book club. Yeah, I should do that. Except I have no time to read. I could start an audio book club, actually. Uh, okay, we'll come back to the elephants. Let's see, what time is it? 8.56. We'll probably run like 10 minutes over, yeah. Okay. Oh, standing up. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is looking pretty sick, though. Honestly, let's just go for it. Let's just go. Let's just go for it in this last, uh, last little, little section here. Sometimes we have to. Sometimes we hold back, but now I think we should just go for it. I'm gonna go, put in the peacock feather, put in some night sky, and then we're gonna. That's gonna be it. And you can't see, but I'm standing right now. So that means that. That means that it's serious, obviously, if I'm standing. Okay, so I'm gonna get this green going, but it's not just straight green. We need some blue in the peacock color. So I'm gonna grab this cobalt blue right here. Cool. Uh, let's see what else is going on. So now we talked through all the serious topics, all the off the cuff topics. What's going on with you guys? Gifts, I'm giving gifts to people. This my, I, should, I should prep like, <laughs> I actually should do this. I should prep like a stand-up bit for like the end of the show. Like <laughs> gifts, huh? You guys heard of this? You guys giving gifts out there? And like press a button and there's like audience laughter. Okay. I'm just going to throw in this peacock feather. Someone said white peacock feather. That would be dope, but it's not going to read, so I'm not going to do that. Um, let's do it like this. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. And is that a good peacock color? Kind of, actually. It kind of is. Let's see if we can make it a little bit more green at the end, though. See, the thing is, this is a perfect example of like the limitations of the paint. I want to just use the straight viridian, but the viridian is too transparent. It was too transparent to do that with, so I had to mix some other colors in, so I couldn't use the straight viridian that I wanted. It's all good. We make it work. I'm going to come in over here. Boom. Perfect. It's pretty good actually. Okay. Yeah, I'm working on gifts for people. I always want to give people books, but then I'm like, am I just that guy? Are you actually going to read this book? Uh, I got a really dope book for my dad. I guess on the show and in real life, like cooking does intersect with like esoterica in a weird way. Uh, and fish, very Christian. <laughs> I got my dad this book uh, called Cooking the Whole Fish or something like that. And it's all about cooking like the weird parts of the fish that people don't normally use, like eyes and organs, I guess, and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. I kind of wanted it for myself, actually. Um, and I found this other book that's like that, but for land animals. It's called like The Odd Bits or something. And it's all about like cooking all the weird parts of the animals that people don't normally use. 
And I went to get that for him, and I was like, there's no way my mom's going to let him cook, like, pork feet or something in the house. So I went with the uh, fishing one instead. I'm trying to get this nice kind of pattern that I'm able to get sometimes. And part of what makes the peacock feather look like a peacock feather is these strands are really close together. If you've seen peacock feathers in real life, at least in my mind, the tapering is like really, really close together actually. I've seen some peacock stuff in like Tibetan stuff. None of the medieval artifacts I've seen in real life have had peacock feathers. But I've seen some Tibetan stuff that had like real peacock feathers in it. Cool. Must be a bitch getting peacock feathers to bed, honestly, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, um, now we wanna drop in a dark, I'm gonna drop in a dark ring of green. You can kinda just, in case anyone's painting, you know, doing art, I always wanna encourage people to be creative. Honestly, for the peacock feather, you can kinda just wing it. As long as it looks even a little bit like a peacock feather, people will know what it is. So it has this kinda dark spot up top. I'm gonna grab the blue from before and just kind of drop in just a little bit of darkness. You need that like high contrast. There we go, it's perfect. And part of what makes it look like a peacock feather is there's a little bit of gold. Um, I have actually this gold color out, but I'm kind of just gonna use yellow instead. I'm gonna mix a little bit of the yellow ochre with lemon yellow in case you're playing along at home. And I'm just going to drop that in there. It's perfect actually. Looks great. Sometimes these feathers are gold. I could put a little gold on them, but it's fine. That looks good, actually. And then and then once it dries, I'll come back and put in just a little bit of crispness. All right, it's 9 o'clock. we got a little bit more time, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to grab a bigger brush so we can do in the night sky, and then we're going to call this bad boy. Uh, RKD said, I have a new co-worker who's from the Gaza Strip, and he has a gold cross from Nazareth he inherited from his grandmother. It's pretty tight. Yeah, that would be pretty tight, dude. They were pretty tight. I've only met a few. Uh, I've met a few like Middle Eastern Christians in real life. It's pretty. They're usually usually pretty cool. Not to judge. Not to judge a whole group of people collectively, which none of us would ever even consider doing. Actually, though. Um, but they're pretty cool. They're usually pretty cool. Uh, okay, where's the Prussian blue? I just need the Prussian blue again. Boom. All right, so here's the question. This is the big question. We're about to wrap this up right now. Am I throwing down the night sky in Prussian blue? That's the color she is. Or am I throwing it down in ultramarine? This is a big call. This is a big call, guys. Oh, I'm going to bring the light back in. It's a little dark over here. Cool. Perfect. Ah, it's a big call. It's a big call right now. Let's see. We're going to do a little test. I'm going to throw down the ultramarine really quick. Normally, I'm, I know what I'm doing 100%. So it's 9 o'clock right now. I'll probably wrap up at 9.10. I said we'd go like 10 minutes over. That's probably what's going to happen. So I'm just going to see. So let's see. I'm going to take the note card. I'm going to grab the ultramarine. I think the ultramarine is going to be like too bright. You know, we don't really want that. Do we though, actually? Dang, I don't know. Maybe we do. Maybe we do. Hmm, let's see what the Prussian blue looks like. I'm going to grab another note card over here. Where's that one? Ultramarine, Prussian blue, it's over here. Okay, boom. Let's see what the Prussian blue looks like. I don't know, I'm kind of torn about the ultramarine. It actually, it kind of does have this winter sky, dark color feel. It's kind of good, but let's see what the, ultra, what the Prussian blue does. Then we'll make a call, we'll start wrapping this thing up. Let's see. So I'm gonna throw a little bit down. I'm gonna bleed it out. I mean, we saw this before, but I'm not really sure either color really has the feel that I want, honestly. This is like what it's like when you're painting along. You know, I'm actually really surprised, but let's go with the ultramarine. This is like cooler. This is like a cooler blue, right? Let's go with the ultramarine. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go with the ultramarine. Uh, there are tons of Oriental Orthodox churches where I live, Syrian Rite, cops from Egypt. That's interesting. Yeah, when I lived in Brooklyn, there were a bunch of churches around, but uh, never went to them. Okay, uh, so we're doing ultramarine. Let's do it. And I'm going to see what I can get away with in terms of just blocking in this dark color. I have a little bit of a catch-22 going on because I have these trees over here and I'm going to have to just go over them. There's no way I can just go in with the wash and like paint in each individual thing. So it might even erase the trees, but who knows? Let's see what happens. 
And there's a principle from Japanese printmaking that I really like to use where they have this dark band at the top of their prints and they say it keeps the eye in the frame, having this like dark band up there. So I like to just keep that in mind that I'm doing this. Yeah, the tree actually stayed in fine. Sorry, I keep tilting the page. So let's see, I move the light a little bit so it's a little bit darker, but then you don't get the reflection. I've almost mastered the lighting thing, but it's still kind of difficult to not get a reflection when you put the wash on. I'm gonna quickly come in. So I'm also moving kind of quickly. You can probably even hear it in my voice just because I want this to look natural. I want it to look like, when you do a wash, this isn't really a wash because I, uh, I'm using a small brush, but when you're putting down a large area of color and watercolor, you really want it to look like it just spilled out of the bottle. You want it to look like just completely accidental and natural. So I'm actually kind of faking that because I am using a small brush. Normally, let's see, I'm just gonna really lightly come over the peacock feather. I hope it doesn't all spill out. Of course it is, but we'll make it work. We will make it work. Okay, I'm gonna come in here. And really quickly, I'm just gonna clear up a little bit. So you're probably watching like, oh my God, no, but it's not a big deal. I'm just gonna come in and quickly pick up a little bit of this area around here. So I'll come back, the last thing I'll do is I'll come back and just tighten that up a little bit, but it actually looks kind of cool getting the color out there. I need a little bit more paint. So I'm gonna come over here, boom. Okay, this actually looks good, man. We've come a long way on the painting show. If anyone was, has watched like the first episodes, like if you were here all the way then, we've come a long way, it's a lot better now, honestly. <laughs> okay, let's come down here. And you can see it's interesting working with the different pigments because look, the tree doesn't come up at all. The tree is totally fine. It doesn't get picked up at all. It's all good though. Okay, it's pretty good actually, but I want it to be a little darker over here. It's a little darker. And I'm just doing that because I don't want it to seem like symbolic that it's lighter over here and darker over here. Actually, what I could do, okay, this is real crazy hours. I'm just gonna do it right now. I could grab a little yellow and just make it like there's a little, almost like a sunrise or something just coming up, a little glow, a little natural glow. It's actually perfect for Faith because it's like, there's this, you know, she's, you know, I was gonna say, she's holding a candle, right? But I was thinking, you know, the problem with the candle is that it's a small light, it's a small man-made light. But with the glow in the background, it's actually perfect because it's like she has this little light that's keeping her illumined, but then there's this imminent illumination coming. It's like the sunrise behind her and it's the same color. So it's like she has this little bit. She has her, her own little bit of the natural glow that's about to like come over the horizon. Man, so dope. Uh, okay, last little bits, last little things. Uh, okay, there are tons of, uh, someone said, uh, ever gonna do more occult fundamentals? Yeah, I wrote that a really long time ago. Yeah, in case anyone doesn't know, what you're referring to is uh, I have Something written, I don't, it's not on my site anymore. It's, on, it's kind of like a secret site I don't really publicize anymore. Um, but yeah, basically what I did was I went back through this book called Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy that despite its name and what you know about my orientation towards <clears throat> things that are styled occult, it actually is a really good book um, in terms of what it purports to document. And I wrote this introduction to the esoterica stuff based on the chapters in that book. Um, you know, it's really interesting actually that you asked me that. I, I actually do, so, so you would think, you know, people would think, you know, I, I, I call myself like a reformed occultist, which is not just what I call myself, it actually kind of is what I am. Um, so you would think like, oh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to, um, uh, do any more stuff like that. But the thing is actually, I'm just going to finish the peacock feather while I'm answering your interesting question. Um, actually I do, I do want to because... I feel like the thing is that there, I've talked about this a little bit before, but I feel like there really is a distinction between esoterica and the occult. And I feel like some things like that, it's almost like by doing stuff like that, I can kind of, you know, lay out what's interesting or historical or, um, you know, like, like, like in my opinion, if you're like a mystically inclined person and you're into like theology and stuff like that, I mean, you should know like what the Zodiac is and how it's played into like different thought systems, right? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's something you should know if you're that kind of person, honestly. Um, 
And I feel like how a lot of the a lot of people get sucked into things that I now think are, are spiritually nefarious is because, you know, there is cool stuff about like, you know, here's how the Zodiac is literally a perfect example. Um, here's how this fits into different thought systems and how this has been influential in history. That's really tight. But the thing is, you're not going to get that information from someone who's just giving you that. It's always going to be paired up with like, so now check out this other thing or like, you know what I mean? So I feel like by doing my own intros to those kind of things, I can kind of just be like, hey, look, here's the reality to something like the Zodiac. Here's the reality to it with none of the, you know, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just telling you. And that way that person is then equipped to know what it is, divorced from like, you know, Urban Outfitters, like how to be a witch books or something. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, it's a whole, whole thing I could go into, but okay. It's time. We just finished it up. This is a good one, man. This is a good one. I'm going to move the clutter away. I'm going to move the clutter away. It's exactly time. It's 9.10. We ran 10 minutes over. I hope that's okay. I hope I'm not keeping anyone from their duties in life. Imagine someone's like, oh, I kick. I can't come. I said I would be there at 9.30, but I'm not going to be there. Owen's going over on the painting stream. I literally can't leave. It's just definitely really happening right now. Okay. Boom. Yeah, so I'm just moving some things so we can see what we came up with here. Ah, <sighs> we're good. This was really intense last uh, 15 minutes. I'm standing. You can't see, but I'm standing, so that I'm really getting into it. Anyway, man, that was dope. This one came out really good. They've been coming out good, man. We've been doing a good job here. Uh, okay, like, like I always say, I always feel like I need to do a little bit of a review, but you know, you were just here. You were just here watching the whole thing, so I don't need to review. But. Uh, I think it came out kind of dope. I'm really feeling how I got, I'm getting the glow. It's kind of like just a little effect, but I've been getting the glow more in the images and I feel like it's really tight. I like, I think my favorite thing that kind of happened, like part of the reason why I like doing the show is like things kind of happen that I wouldn't normally plan. I really like the color and symbolic sync up between the sunrise and the candle that I said, and then the rose is glowing light as like a, spiritual symbol and how it kind of ties together. I always, when I use the candle in my art, I always am thinking what I said, that it, it's it's symbolic of like a temporal, a candle goes out, a candle goes out really easily and it inevitably, inevitably burns out. So it's kind of not a perfect symbol for spiritual illumination in and of itself entirely, but it fits in because it's light, it's keeping you light in the darkness. So I actually kind of like the tie-in with like the natural light. I'll probably use that more in another image or something. Anyway though, it's that time. We could hang out all night, but it's that time. To end the stream, thank you for coming through. I really enjoy doing this. So thank you uh, thank you so much for coming, hanging out. If it wasn't for you, I would just be talking to myself at my table, which I do often, but it's not as fun as hanging out with you guys. So thanks for coming through. Hope you enjoyed yourself. And now it's time. You know it's time for us to go back to our own individual spiritual quests that all come together on the chessboard of spiritual warfare that we all play on every day. Good metaphor. We'll end it there. Thanks for coming through, and I will see you guys on the internet where we all hang out together. Good luck, and uh, have a good night. I'll see you guys later. Bye.